All right, then. Welcome to this uh, special live stream on TSG Multimedia. I'm John, your host of the channel, and I'm being joined here by Trevor and Paul, my friends from, well, kind of from Santa Cruz. That's where we would normally hang out in any case. And if you've been watching the channel, you know that this morning we had the final, I guess, ultimate layout tour video of the Fern Creek in Western and that's the uh, Garden Railroad that Trevor and Paul built with their friend and I guess our mutual friend, Eric Child, uh, who is no longer with <clears throat> us. Today. And uh, this is the final send off. So I'm going to kind of turn it over to you guys. And thanks for doing this. I think that uh, it's something that needs to be done. At least I feel like it does for me just to finally close the chapter, you know. But uh, yeah, so what do you have to say for yourselves? <laughs> Maybe introduce yourselves and, and so people know, under, they understand who you are and what this is yeah. about. Well, so in, as John mentioned, um, I'm Trevor Park. I am uh, uh, one of the people that started the Fern Creek and Western Garden Railroad back in 2014. Um, and uh, I'm going to be kind of leading the presentation tonight uh, about... Uh, the legacy, not only of the Fern Creek and Western, but of Eric, who was a very good friend to all of us. Um, and uh, I think, you know, the layout tour that just came out this morning does a really, really good job of capturing the railroad in its final stage of life. Um, as John said, the ultimate layout tour. Um, but the thing that's hard to capture through a video like that is the evolution of the railroad over time. And I think that's mostly what the presentation tonight is going to cover is uh, how it evolved, how it came to be, how the players got involved, a little more of the backstory of the Fern Creek and Western, and then kind of what the future holds a little more in depth now that we have more information on that. Yeah, and I'm Paul Nolan. I've uh, been involved with the Fern Creek and Western for near the beginning. It started with, uh, with Trevor and Eric. And uh, you'll you'll find out more about that, I assume, as the presentation continues. But uh, yeah, it's a it's a very interesting story, I think, about how it came together and how we we all came to be friends. And uh, not just you know our intention of the railroad was just as a fun project for ourselves, but it really turned into like almost a community model railroad club. It was kind of something we never imagined to happen. And uh, yeah, I'm really thankful to uh, have been a part of it. But uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to your presentation, Trevor. <laughs> well, I mean, you'll be you'll be adding some things in too because there's some parts okay. of the story that you'll have to tell. That I mean, you'll see them, you'll know what to say. <laughs> oh so. yeah, I'm sure. So I think we're ready, John. You're muted. John's muted. You know, I'm usually very good about that. One last thing I want to mention: two things before we uh, bring up the presentation. One is, and I've talked about this or alluded to it over the years, that this, one, one of the things I always like to do for the channel is find what I call good stories. And this story of Eric befriending you guys and what all of that became is absolutely one of my favorite stories. So it means a lot to me that way as well. And the other thing I want to mention is for people in the comments, if they have questions, we actually have our top secret associate producer today. So if you do have a question during the presentation, she'll be highlighting stuff that's relevant uh, on the screen. So, uh, you know, please do ask questions and you can ask questions of anybody who's on here, you know, ask me anything, <laughs> right? And uh, anyway, with that, uh, let's bring the presentation up and uh, take it away, Trevor. Yeah. So, you know, as I said, this is kind of the comprehensive story of the railroad, uh, but not only the railroad, but also Eric and how we met Eric and how Eric befriended us. And um, to really understand this story, I, I feel like we need to start where it really all began. And that's actually with Paul and I. Um, and there's going to be some great embarrassing photos in here. Um, nice. So, uh, so Paul and I, long story short, met because my aunt 
lived next door to Paul when we were growing up. And that was the case probably until we were about um, uh, 15 years old or so. And um, as you can see in this photo on the right, we're uh, sitting in Paul's garage uh, playing with his train layout uh, that is in the garage there uh, on a piece of uh, four by six plywood. Um, but, uh, in the background of the photo beyond that car and the house that's, uh, the house that's across the street, there was actually the Santa Cruz branch line, which was a, uh, ex Southern Pacific line, uh, at that time, union Pacific, uh, and they were still running trains on it at the time. So we would basically sit in Paul's house, play with model trains and rail fan, uh, these local trains going by that no longer run, uh, at this point, the Santa Cruz branch is, uh, uh nearly a defunct line at this point. Um, and so oh, there's, there's one more thing to mention in this photo too, I might add, is that there's G scale on the floor. There, there, there is G scale. And I was just about ready to mention the one thing I don't have any pictures of is the mud pit Pacific. Oh yeah. Uh, because in Paul's backyard, there was this muddy area, uh, that we set up G scale track and somehow didn't electrocute ourselves in it. And so, um, uh, we, that was where we kind of cut our teeth at first with G scale, um, but, uh, the photo on the left shows us as young rail fans at Roaring Camp with, uh, Tom Shreve, who still works there, actually. He'll come back in the presentation later, so, uh, keep your eyes out for him. Um, now, Eric, uh, he is kind of, uh, more of an interesting story on how we met him. Um, so, Eric, uh, moved to Santa Cruz sometime in the 1990s, I uh, can't remember the exact year, but grew up, uh, around the Bay Area, and always had a fascination, particularly for toy trains, um, not necessarily model trains, but toy trains. And um, one thing Eric uh, believed in greatly, and is something that uh, should be a theme throughout this whole, uh, basically, memorial of Eric, is uh, that Eric uh, very much valued passing model railroading and toy trains, and even prototype railroading, on to the next generation. And uh, one of the things he saw that uh, he felt was lacking in this world of uh, passing it on was that kids generally didn't get to run the trains. A lot of the time, adults would stand behind the counter and tell kids not to touch their trains. And so Eric decided uh, to approach the Santa Cruz Museum of Art and History uh, in downtown Santa Cruz, where Paul and I both grew up, and uh, uh, see if they would be willing to do a toy train display where the kids could run the trains and then the local toy train operating society members uh, would set up the layout and operate it. And so Eric was the one that pioneered that. Um, and these photos that you see are from the first year they ever did it in 2006 um, when it was in just a little small side room of the museum. It has since moved into the main atrium lobby of the museum and has grown exponentially in size. But this was the very first year they did it. Um, and as you can see, even back then, they had kids running the trains. Eric there on the right is uh, showing kids how to use a remote control to run the trains. And that is where Paul comes into the equation. Uh, Paul is that little character off to the right with his hand over his face, oh staring at the trains intently. Um, and uh, Paul, I guess, tell people a little bit about how you got to that place. Well, first of all, I want to say I don't know if I've ever seen this photo before, and that's uh, that's amazing. Um, yeah, so uh, I, I I'm pretty sure the first time I visited this room was with my first grade class. We, you know, back at our elementary school, we used to take field trips around, and they said, "Oh, there's there's a Christmas train display going on downtown." So everybody in my class went in their cars with their parents, and uh, we took a trip down there to see the trains, and I was like this is awesome. You know, there's, there's, there are all, all these trains in this tiny little room. And I was like, I, you know, of course me, I, when I see something like that, I want to go talk to the people that are running it. So I, I got Eric's attention somehow, or my, you know, maybe my mom got his attention and uh, I, you know, showed a whole bunch of interest in, in the layout and, you know, it, Eric got the, got the sense that I wanted to be involved in it, I suppose. So he invited me to help out with the display the next year. And, uh, yep, good, good, perfectly timed slide. And, uh, <laughs> I, I helped out with it down there along with Trevor for, for many, many years. And, uh, it, it expanded 
in that tiny little room out to occupying the whole lobby area in the Museum of Art and History. And it was, uh, it, yeah, they still do it, but it's a, it's a pretty sizable layout. And uh, I think one year we even brought uh, two HO scale layouts that Trevor and I restored. We, we had a little corner of HO scale. Oh, yeah. that comes later. Okay, excellent. Yeah. Um, so this is how Eric met Paul. Um, but it turns out, and I thought this was how I met Eric, um, was through Ma, because Paul invited me down there once he started getting involved, like, you got to come to this place. But uh, Eric later on in life told me that actually the first time he saw me was at this place. Uh, this was a garden railroad up in the Soquel foothills, kind of near my house. Soquel is kind of a little south of Santa Cruz, which is the specific area I grew up. Um, and it was owned by a guy named Dan Riggs. Um, and we found this by chance because someone at my elementary school knew about it. And we went up and down the street knocking on doors, seeing who had a garden railroad. A typical thing of my mom to do. Uh, so um, anyway, uh, I got to help out at Dan's railroad uh, for many years, from probably about 2006 or so till about 2010, which is when it, about when time it went defunct. Um, so you can see these photos of me uh, as a little kid, um, you know, working on this railroad. And actually the engine to the right of me left of the screen in that bigger photo was my first G-scale engine I ever got. And I still have. And it did run on the Fern Creek and Western a little bit, which is kind of cool to see that it has moved around to a lot of different railroads. Um, I'll also mention that a full circle moment of this is, you know, so Eric... Uh, was there for an open house and saw me running around went god you know this little kid running around you know he's uh got quite away with the trains and is running around like a chicken with his head cut off which is still something i do um but uh that photo in the bottom there actually shows eric digging trees out of this very same railroad about 10 years later uh, because when they moved um, and uh, were not able to maintain that railroad in that location anymore, uh, we ended up taking the trees from it. Uh, and so it was kind of a full circle moment to go back there and remove part of that railroad. And a lot of the track from the Fern Creek and Western actually came from here too. Um, so, and that's how I kind of got my start in garden railroading. From the moment that I was at this railroad, I wanted a garden railroad. I knew right there and then that was what I wanted. So, um, <clears throat> as I mentioned, uh, you know, I made it down to Ma, and uh, we expanded a lot at Ma, especially in this year where these pictures are from, which is 2013. Uh, that's when Paul and I started getting our way on how we were going to expand, and we decided to build a O-scale switching layout complete with all the post-war Lionel accessories we could possibly shoehorn into it. Um, and then, of course, the HO layouts, uh, which are pictured on the right. Uh, one of them was Paul's personal layout, and one of them was a layout from another friend of ours that we had rebuilt and uh, merged together. So um, that was kind of how the Ma story went. Um, but it came to be that I found out by being at Ma um, <clears throat> that Eric was actually into full-size uh, railroad equipment as well, um, and particularly into passenger car restoration. Um, and so, uh, I figured out he was working at the Niles Canyon railway, um, the Pacific locomotive association, uh, which is about an hour from where we were on passenger car restoration. I said, you know, I'd really like to come up there and see what you do. Cause I was aspiring to be in the heritage railroad industry at that time, hanging out around roaring camp, as many of you probably know. And, um, <clears throat> so Eric brought me up there and, uh, we got to take a look around the place and, uh, at that point, Eric was like, well, do you want to get involved? And I was like, well, I didn't know there was even opportunities for someone my age to get involved in that sort of thing. Um, and at the time, Eric was working on the restoration of uh, the Southern Pacific 2473 and 2474, which are a pair, uh, articulated set um, of coaches uh, that were built for the SP's Daylight that ran between San Francisco and Los Angeles. Um, and they were working on the interior restoration of that car at the time. And I got put to work uh, wiring all the lighting for it and wiring ballasts and stuff for the fluorescent lighting. It was a great learning experience. Got to get my hands dirty with the equipment. And it was uh, really a nice opportunity uh, to be able to do that. Um, but Eric's real passion that was at Niles Canyon was the Cascade Club, which was actually a triple uh, three-car set 
that was used on the night train that ran from Portland, Oregon to San Francisco. And that car is pictured on the right. That was Eric's passion project that unfortunately never was completed in his lifetime and is uh, still very much a restoration project at this point, as far as I'm aware. But I figured I'd put that in there because Eric was very passionate about that car. Uh, that was kind of his baby there at Niles. He was actually the project manager of that car for a while. So anyway, in working at Niles, I would commute over uh, to Niles with Eric. And um, I would be dropped off at Eric's by my parents and notice that there was a loop of Garden Railroad track in the front yard. Really small loop um, where the present day sawmill was uh, before the railroad was torn out. And... Um, it came to be that I found out Eric had had a much larger garden railroad at one time. And so we're now going to look at the Fern Creek and Western's predecessor. I don't know if it ever had a name or not, um, but we'll quickly just look through it. It was a much more you know, rudimentary railroad, for lack of a better term, compared to what uh, we ended up building there um, in the time that Paul and I were involved. But Eric did have a pretty sizable garden railroad that ran all the way around the house. Um, the two uh, photos, the one on the left and very bottom right, those were uh, in the backyard, kind of where the, uh, you know, Priya Canyon trestle and the big tunnel was and all that. And then, of course, the uh, top right photo is the front yard where the big snail grade was up against the house there. Uh, looked totally different back then. Uh, this is the backyard near where Nolensburg was on the left hand side. And all of those shots are kind of in the Nolensburg Fern Creek yard area. Again, just totally different railroad than what we ended up building. Um, but uh, a lot of the equipment that was here um, was there when I came around. And as a matter of fact, the South Pacific Coast 21, which is the steam engine in that photo, actually ran a lot on the Fern Creek and Western. I still have it. It's kind of my attachment piece to Eric, if you will, because it ran on his original railroad and on the Fern Creek and Western quite heavily. Um, so... I also had to include this photo. Eric was actually a, a huge S scale fan, S gauge fan, I should say, um, uh, which was primarily made by American Flyer. That was the train set he had when he was growing up. And if Kevin Hill's watching, uh, he'll be very happy that I mentioned this because he's a huge Flyer fan till, uh, too. But um, Eric actually tried to build an outdoor S gauge layout above his garden railroad. Uh, never did work well, but I found this photo and had to include it because I think he's the only person I know of in the world that hasn't had an outdoor S gauge layout at one time. <laughs> um, but anyway, the photo on the right shows kind of the very last rendition of Eric's former railroad um, over the, what became Fern Creek and all that. And then the left-hand photo shows the railroad grounds as they were the first day I arrived for construction. That is how it looked uh, after his railroad was taken out. And at the moment we decided to construct the Fern Creek and Western. Uh, it was pretty barren ground at that time. Um, and there had just been a tree that had been removed in this photo. If you look in the photo on the right, there's actually a quite a large tree in the background, which occupies uh, the area where the Creek that ran down uh, the later creek and the Priya Canyon mine was and all that. Um, and so uh, Eric had that tree removed. That was the big thing before we started building the railroad. And this was right after the tree removal when we finally were able to start construction. So we're going to take a look quickly at uh, the early construction photos of the Fern Creek and Western, uh, because these are photos that a lot of people have never seen. Um, I had forgotten that many of them existed myself, but um, it was uh, quite a different story back then uh, compared to how it ended up looking at the end. Um, so this is the area where uh, the Birch Canyon Straits is. We were building up the cinder blocks at that time and laying track directly on the patio. And Eric and I were digging out cuts to get the track up the hill um, around Tunnel 1 and all that area in the uh, photos on the right. Uh, the photo on the left shows Tunnel 1 under construction. As I uh, probably mentioned in the layout tour, we built it out of cinder blocks um, uh, with a plywood top, which ended up being a huge mistake uh, in the long run because the plywood top uh, started giving way toward the end of the railroad's life. But um, that was the tunnel under construction. And then on the right was actually the very first train that ever ran on the Fern Creek in Western. That was the first movement of any equipment on the track we had laid down. 
uh, pulled by our two truck Shea and a couple of passenger cars we had uh, that have since found other homes. But uh, that was actually the first train movement. And I believe uh, that was June 14th, if I remember correctly, of 2014 or June 16th, one of those two. Um, and there's me running one of the first trains over the railroad um, as a 14 year old in that photo uh, uh, going up the hill over the first crossing of Fern Creek. That brought back a lot of memories when I found that photo. But uh, in any case, <clears throat> this is the push out to the front yard uh, as we started doing that. Because once we built up the hill and back, we did run the railroad for a, a small amount of time. And it's just a point to point railroad up the hill and back. But then we started building out into the front. Um, and so you can see Eric cutting track in the backyard and we'd started landscaping in the backyard. And then of course, pushing out front through the curvature that goes under where the uh, big bridge in front ended up being uh, further on down the road. These were some of the first train movements that happened in the front yard um, after we had uh, built the main line. Uh, interestingly enough, under that big fill uh, that the engine's sitting on, on the right, on the top there, uh, we were trying to figure out a way to basically fill that area so we wouldn't have to use dirt. And so under all that was a bunch of bricks that we put uh, under there. And uh, again, a construction method that turned out to not be such a great idea. But, um, you know, part of this whole railroad, especially in the first five years, was learning from mistakes to figure out how to do it right. And that's why the railroad ended up looking so nice in the end, is we did learn from a lot of mistakes. <clears throat> So after we got the main line open and a lot of um, sightings put in, uh, we ended up doing an open house uh, sometime in September of 2014. Uh, and this, these are pictures from the first open house that we ever had. Um, we, we had some great moments during that open house. Paul, this is about the time Paul started getting involved too, because I think Paul was at that first open house. Um, and uh, so some of the engines pictured here are from friends like Chris Gupta and uh, Scott Kennedy and people like that that brought their locomotives over, Alex Matuzic, um, and they all came over and brought engines, and we had a grand old time running the railroad. And mind you, back in these days, the entire railroad was track power. So as we were constructing this, we were also having to be really careful about the electrical conductivity of the track and all that uh, so that things would run correctly. And uh, boy, did we figure out during that open house how great battery was because that yellow locomotive there uh, was the first battery engine to ever run on our railroad. And I think that was the point at which we became sold on battery and realized, oh, we've made a ginormous mistake uh, making this whole railroad track power. So uh, that was our first uh, foyer into, uh, into uh, battery power was that ordeal. Um, that was also when the stock car went into the pond, but that's a story for another time. I do have a video of that somewhere. Yeah. Uh, 2014 was also the first year that Halloween happened at Eric's. Um, Paul and I had done Halloween actually at his house for a number of years. Uh, but Eric uh, told me, you know, hey, we get a lot of trick-or-treaters here for Halloween. You should do Halloween here. And I was like, oh, yeah, you probably get like, you know, 50 trick-or-treaters. And boy, was I wrong. Uh, even that first year, we found out how many people would come for Halloween. And from there, it just kept growing and growing and growing. But that shows you how basic Halloween was in the early days at Fern Creek. And then I specifically put the picture there on the right um, of that caboose, because uh, that caboose I bought uh, was the first piece of 1 to 20.3 scale rolling stock that we bought. We had a couple of locomotives that were 1 to 20.3, but no cars. And when this car showed up, it was by far the best looking thing we had. And this was kind of the first inkling I had about uh, differentiating scale and all that sort of stuff uh, in within G scale. Uh, G, G scale or G gauge has multiple different scales associated with it. And 1 to 20.3 scale is F scale. Um, or FN3 in this case, which is uh, F narrow gauge, three foot gauge uh, track. So it basically uh, upsizes the proportion of the equipment relative to G scale track to make it look right for three foot gauge. And that was the first true three foot gauge car we had. And uh, that kind of set the tone for some things to come further down the line. So the railroad's first winter, uh, another learning experience of figuring out how to level track all throughout the winter and 
keep leaves clean and all that. But um, there were some great photos that I took during that year because I had just gotten a nice camera and I figured I'd include those. Uh, this is kind of when some of the uh, later engine stars showing up. We kind of had an initial batch of engines that were given to us by Chris Gupta, our friend. And um, then uh, later on, the two climaxes up at the top showed up. That very top one is actually the number six, which uh, we showed in the layout tour uh, as that super detailed climax. That's what it looked like back in the old days. Um, so after that winter, uh, in the first year of running the railroad, we decided that we needed to expand. Expansion will become a really big theme of pretty much every Fern Creek and Western story from here on out, because we just kept growing and growing and growing from there on. Um, this is the push into the uh, center section, as we used to call it back then. We ended up ripping out the walkway that's on the left-hand side. We pushed into that center section, and that little area is actually where Eric's little loop of track I was talking about at the beginning was, uh, where he had that little loop uh, that I would see when I was getting dropped off for Niles. We started putting in a new yard in front there, and we started putting in all sorts of sidings all over the railroad, such as the one you see up there at uh, what back then was a log camp. Uh, in, a, in modern day became Nolensburg. And then the picture on the bottom right uh, is actually of the little uh, 040 Porter locomotive we had, which ended up being our first battery conversion. And that engine uh, was actually purchased from Caboose Hobbies in Denver while we were in Denver. Uh, Eric and I, uh, long story short, took a train all the way from Emeryville to Denver that was a private charter that was just us two and a uh, passenger car manager for Iowa Pacific on board uh, and rode across the country essentially and ended up in um, the uh, in Denver and had a little bit of time there, went to Caboose Hobbies and bought this thing and brought it home with us. And that ended up being our first battery conversion. Uh, and we put the batteries in the trailer car that you see behind it. It was another huge learning process. It took me about uh, four months to convert that locomotive. And by the end of it, we were able to do battery conversions in just a day or two. But that was uh, quite the fun experience getting to finally have a battery engine. It became the only thing we ran pretty much. Um, so again, more yard tracks. We put in tons of yard tracks uh, to accommodate our ever expanding fleet of cars that we were starting to acquire. And uh, 2015 was also the year we purchased our first live steam locomotive. Live steam was something I'd always wanted to get into, uh, but the cost had been so prohibitive as a young teenager that I couldn't really get into it. And Eric's friend was selling that little Forney you see on the right-hand side at the top. And um, that Forney uh, ended up being our first live steam locomotive we ever had, and it's still with us to this day. This was also kind of the first spring for the railroad too. Uh, and that uh, area down below that photo shows just how the greenery was starting to fill in uh, on the Fern Creek and Western. And Dave, to answer your question, uh, I don't uh, personally use Bloonami yet anyway. Um, I've installed it in John's locomotive and I really liked it. And it's something I hope to do a little more in the future. This was the first anniversary of the railroad uh, where we lined up every bit of motive power we had um, on the tracks to take a picture. Uh, the collection had grown quite a bit by that point. Uh, quite a few of these engines are actually no longer with us at this point. Um, they've been sold off or, you know, modified or in some way, shape or form. Uh, but uh, this was the first anniversary and a pretty proud moment for us uh, to have made it a year. Uh, little did we know that the journey was just starting at that point. Hey, Trevor, mm -hmm. I think from that picture that you just had, that mm -hmm. one, if that's only a year in, you must have had some sense that I'm sure Eric had the sense that he was in trouble. Uh, <laughs> I I think it took Eric a little longer to figure that out than than <laughs> most people. But uh, you we know, got away with a lot. We got away with a lot. Yeah. <laughs> It's a lot for yeah. one year. <laughs> it is a lot for one year. Yeah. Yeah. So um, this is also the kind of the first year where we started taking up some modeling projects. Um, so this is the South Pacific Coast number three engine that we had. I still have to this day, actually. And um, I wanted to gussy it up and make it look a little nicer and uh, make it look like a polished passenger locomotive. 
And so uh, this was kind of the first um, venture into modeling in G-Scale. I'd been modeling in HO for a number of years up to that point. Um, but this is kind of the first big modeling project we did in G-Scale, uh, where I took the whole engine down to nothing, painted it, all that sort of stuff. And this was actually a really good learning experience to figure out how the Bachman engines are all put together because they're all relatively similar uh, on the very basic aspects of how they work. And so uh, getting the opportunity to take one apart and put it back together and redo it was a great learning opportunity to really get acquainted with the mechanics of these G-scale locomotives or F-scale locomotives as the case may be. Hey, Trevor, um, did you see... Did you see the question that popped up? Yes, I, I was just about ready to respond oh, okay. to that. Um, uh, so I would definitely do live steam again. Uh, I think that there's two, you have to have kind of two schools of thought about live steam versus battery. If you want something, it'll just run, 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 and it's easy for anyone to pick up a throttle and deal with. Battery is the way to go. But if you want something that people are really going to come away with, with the wow factor, um, and have something that's more interesting for you, especially as someone who has run a train over your own railroad many times, most likely, uh, live steam is definitely the way to go. Um, there's definitely uh, benefits to both, which is why we had both. And I, I love our live steam engines. I still have all of them. I actually have one or two of them up here with me in Oregon uh, that I can run on the live steam track that's kind of local to me here. <clears throat> so uh, here's Paul's first appearance on the, this whole thing at Fern Creek. Um, uh, Paul became our ballasting guru very quickly uh, during this time period because we were constantly ballasting track all the way till the end of days on that railroad. Um, and uh, so there's Paul ballasting the yard on top of the patio there. Uh, this was also the year we built the engine house, the red engine house that became so synonymous with the Fern Creek and Western. There was actually an article in Garden Railways magazine that included us uh, building that uh, structure. And uh, then, of course, we kept pushing forward on battery conversion. So you see shade number 10 there in the bottom right hand side being converted to battery. I think all told, we did like four or five battery conversions that year. Um, so that was, that was kind of the time at which we said no more track power. We need to go battery. Uh, so uh, 2016 was the last year that we used track power to my knowledge. Uh, 2015 was also a very interesting year because we had a bit of interesting um, uh, uh, publication I'm uh, missing the word here, but uh, anyway, uh, publicity, there we go. We had some good publicity uh, for the railroad in the form of an article by the Santa Cruz Sentinel, uh, which is the local newspaper. Um, some neighbors of ours had uh, told the Sentinel about our railroad and um, they came out and took some photos and wrote a little story about it. And I figured this would be kind of cool. It would be in the newspaper and it was leading up to an open house. Little did we know it was going to be the front page of the Friday morning newspaper. Um, and uh, we were not quite prepared for how many people that was going to bring out. And the photo on the left shows the open house that resulted from that uh, uh, publicity in the newspaper. And there was hundreds of people in our yard, in Eric's yard that day, um, <laughs> viewing the railroad. It was really quite a turnout. I think it still holds the record for the most people at a single open house. Um, but, uh, that was a pretty neat experience getting to be written up in the newspaper like that on the front page. And speaking of publicity, this was also the year that, uh, TSG multimedia first showed up. And, uh, this was the year, the layout tour, the first layout tour ever on TSG multimedia was filmed at Fern Creek and Western. And, uh, and we had a great time filming that originally, if I remember correctly, John, um, you didn't know what you were going to do with all that footage and decided to put a layout tour together out of it. And that's what started the whole layout tours program, if I'm not mistaken, right? I think if I remember correctly, we did actually shoot with the intention of making it some kind of a layout tour because I have all that original narration, which is a layout oh, tour. Yeah, but that narration I gave to you afterward, that, like like six months later. Oh, I didn't remember that, but you're probably yeah. your memory is probably better than mine. Yeah, so no, I, that, that that narration that opens it and closes it and all that I gave you later. Um, 
Yeah, I knew we had some narration that was later, but I thought yeah. we did the majority of the narration on, on that day, didn't we? Uh, yeah, some of it. Because I had but... that handheld mic, if I remember right. Yeah. Oh, that's right. But, yeah, I forgot about yeah, that. I mean, it doesn't really matter. What The important thing, I think, is that this, this was the first uh, layout tour, I think, that I did certainly the first garden scale layout tour that I ever shot and uh, won't be the last, that's for sure. Yeah. So um, 2016 was a big year for us uh, because that was the year of the National Garden Railway Convention, what would end up being the first National Garden Railway Convention we did. We'd ended up doing two of them in the railroad's existence. Uh, and we, I think uh, we suffered what many people do, which is, oh, the National Convention is not that far away. The National Convention, you know, it's not a big deal. And then all of a sudden you're a couple months away from it. And, oh, my God, we got to knuckle down and get these projects done and get the railroad in tip top shape. So um, we worked pretty tirelessly once uh, summer vacation started at that point, uh, trying to clean up rolling stock, level track, uh, get all of our ducks in a row, so to speak, to open up for this big national convention crowd. Um, and again, more modeling projects were going on. I was uh, the top right corner is what became engine number 13. Uh, that I painted completely and again took apart down to nothing. And then this was also the first uh, time that a new locomotive showed up on the property uh, in the form of number 12, which is the engine there on the bottom right hand uh, corner, which is a Bachman C19. And it's still one of my favorite engines that we have. They are just gorgeous models. Uh, but that was the first new engine that ever showed up. So we were starting to keep continuing to build the fleet even more at this point, uh, gearing up for that national convention. Um, one of the big projects we wanted to accomplish before the national convention was building this retaining wall in front, the great wall, uh, as we called it. And, um, and it's, and it was quite the, uh, tribulation to build this thing because we had to, you know, dig out all the area, put down sand, level it, put the blocks in, backfill it. And we didn't have quite the construction skills that we had at the end of, uh, the building of the railroad. Uh, so my dad helped us with this a little bit, and Eric and Paul and I uh, built this great wall uh, that still is there to this day and still standing uh, as a testament to all the work we did on that railroad. Uh, and then we also uh, were installing rivers in the front yard at this point. So you can see Eric there on the right-hand side filling up the pond after we first built um, the rivers in, front, in the front yard, the first rendition of the river that was in the front. Uh, and then the other thing we were working on at this time, which is still one of my most favorite projects we've ever worked on was the wet restoration of uh, our wigwag. Now the wigwag is actually owned by a, a member of the Golden Gate Railroad Museum, a friend of ours uh, who volunteers there. Um, but we were restoring it at the time uh, because GGRM uh, at that time was planning on trying to move to Santa Cruz. So we restored the wig, restored the wigwag um, and then ended up living at the Fern Creek and Western after that all fell through. But uh, the wigwag kind of became a uh, really neat conversation piece and kind of a keystone of the Fern Creek and Western. And uh, we're really proud of the work we did on restoring that. Eric and I put a lot of heart and soul into making sure that wigwag was in really nice shape, both operationally and cosmetically. And again, probably one of the most fun projects we worked on outside of just the railroad building itself. So after all the hard work, we uh, ended up opening up for the national convention for two different days. Um, these are pictures from the convention of everyone enjoying the trains. And uh, at the very end of it, a picture of all three of us together, which, you know, unfortunately, looking back on it is one of the very few photos we have of all three of us together. It was just something we didn't take group photos all that often. Uh, wish we had more, but, um, but that's one of my favorite photos we have of all of us together. Um, as for um, the question below there on stable long-term basis for track, so what we did was, in the end was we would build a foundation out of uh, clay and then dig a trench in it that we filled with gravel and uh, then sunk the track into that and then ballasted on top of that. And that provided really good drainage and a pretty stable base. Now, there's a lot more permanent and stable things you can do, such as a concrete roadbed or wood roadbed underneath it with risers. And those are far more permanent methods of uh, fixing the track down, but uh, they take a lot of work. Um, we we did it in a couple of areas. We did, we built a garden box that you'll see later, and it, it is a lot of work to make that happen. Well, 
And I would say that most of the track was just basically in earth with a gravel trench, but the yeah. uh, the hill in front was uh, primarily clay construction. Yeah, yeah, that was kind of the ultimate. Right, that was the most uh, the ultimate, recent uh, thing solution built, so. on on that because um, that was the, the that was the latest area we did base from the ground construction up on was that particular spot. I want to mention something real quick about picture the pictures of the three of you together. There's a whole program that we recorded right where I'm sitting. That was the three of you guys and me doing a live program like this but here in person and uh that's one thing i i went back and watched recently and found it to be a, a really fun episode of you know live streaming that people can watch it's in the playlist of the fern creek and western which i added to the description of this video uh, that you're talking about you know not having a lot of pictures of you yeah. guys together and that came to mind because we were all like i said all sitting right here yeah. Uh, together that was a really fun show and i actually re-watched a good portion of it recently too and it's well worth watching i think it kind of brings out uh, eric's core values very well i thought so too i also liked the part where he referred to you as the little blonde kid at the garden yeah, scale yeah. the railroad that you were showing earlier yeah <laughs> yep some things don't change i guess he didn't say brat or anything like that but he did say that little blonde kid he probably was thinking it probably yeah but um anyway so this is the end of 2016 um this is uh where we started figuring out how to do tree pruning this was kind of when i first started pruning the trees which is something we talk about a lot in the layout tour uh to again increase the realism of the railroad and again uh back to 1 to 20.3 so we kind of went all this time you know from buying that caboose to this picture here which was in late 2016 with not really buying any more 1 to 20.3 equipment. And then uh, uh, someone brought over this box car um, and we put it next to one of our 1 to 22.5 or 1 to 24 scale box cars and went, oh my God, this doesn't look right. And then we put it next to the caboose and went, wow, this looks a lot better. And it was at that point we decided we needed to make the switch to 1 to 20.3 true F scale. Um, and so from here on out, you're going to see all of a sudden a huge change in the equipment from all these very plasticky, you know, Bachman, Big Hauler, Delton sort of cars uh, to Spectrum and AMS uh, and even some scratch built 1 to 20.3 scale uh, cars that are very nicely detailed. So um, 2017 to 18, I've kind of combined these two years together a little bit. And as I was making this presentation, I was going, God, why did not much happen in 2017 and 18? And then I remembered I had a girlfriend. Um, so uh, that uh, curtailed the amount of railroad time I had at that point. Uh, but basically, um, we were figuring out at this point, what else could we build? Where else could we build the railroad? And also realizing at this time that, um, you know, we had built a lot of stuff um, with not very good construction methods and it was starting to show. Uh, <laughs> we needed to uh, rebuild a lot of what we had built. And also our interests were starting to change, you know, with the battery power coming more into the picture on the railroad, uh, we wanted more switching opportunities, operation stuff. Um, we hadn't quite gotten fully into operations yet, but uh, we wanted to change what we had done and make it better. So you'll see a lot of changes on the railroad coming up in this part of the presentation. Um, so and it, I just want to interject a little thing in here. One of the things we had to do uh, as part of the rebuilding was uh, widening a lot of the curves. Most of the curves we had built the railroad with were a little too sharp for um, the 1 to 20.3 scale equipment. So here we are putting in uh, the new bridge in uh, the back at Priya Canyon uh, with the 8 foot diameter curves that would allow the 1 to 20.3 scale equipment to run very well over it. Uh, but that photo was actually taken on Eric's birthday. Um, and, uh, the car that you see on the right hand side was the very first car we ever lettered for the Fern Creek and Western, uh, number 400, the box car. And we presented that to Eric as his birthday present, um, that day. And it, that was probably one of the most, um, uh, touching moments, I think of 
the whole time we were at Fern Creek because he had no idea that was coming. He was so surprised, so grateful. Um, and it was one of those moments where we were able to return the favor of putting a smile on his face, just like he did for us when we were kids, because he was acting like a kid again when he got that car. Was, so, that the same, was that the same time when we had the bridge dedication that day? Yep. Yep. And that's us putting the track. We put the track in that morning for the bridge dedication. So we were yeah. working right up to the, uh, the, 11th hour on that one that was almost exactly like a certain number because wasn't that in april uh march 25th oh it was in march so it was almost exactly what is that eight years ago six six years ago my math Something isn't like so that. good yeah yeah, yeah I mean, his birthday that. is march 25th yeah wow okay yeah that was a really uh memorable day for sure yeah doesn't seem that long ago yeah. but i do remember thinking that when you presented him with the card, we did the bridge dedication. He was definitely all, all smiles, like a slightly, like a different demeanor almost. I remember yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. It was definitely a, a really um, rewarding moment for sure. I remember rushing to uh, get that bridge finished in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> one of the, one of the many projects we rushed on that railroad and though there will be some more uh, rushing later on in the presentation. Um, you're going to see the trains rushing around here. Yeah. <laughs> rushing trains. The, is that yeah. The about? rushing oh. trains. Yeah. The rushing trains. Yeah. Um, Thanks, Gary. so, uh, 2017, we also started on the construction of the log branch. Remember how I said that, uh, where else can we expand to? Well, the other side of the driveway in the front yard had these lemon trees. Um, and Eric loved these lemon trees, but they were pathetic. Um, and, uh, I told Eric, you know, we could build a logging branch, you know, like a point to point operations based logging branch and have a special place to run all these geared locomotives we've acquired, uh, because we had so many rod engines and so many geared engines. We wanted to have a place to run both of them kind of separate. And I don't know how I convinced him on this one. I feel like this is one of my greatest accomplishments of the Hearn Creek and Western was, was convincing Eric on this. Uh, cause he agreed and we started building the log branch. It took, uh, quite some time to get the whole thing completed. Cause we went through a number of different design changes and we had to construct another one of those walls in front, like you saw us constructing in the front yard. Um, so, uh, we had to do that. We had to fill the whole area and you'll see that here in just a moment, but the log branch ended up being one of the most neat parts of the railroad. Um, probably a favorite of all the operators cause it was nice and raised up and, uh, really, operationally based it was very uh um well well done at the end i thought and so there's eric time. oh go ahead i want to make Let i want to make one comment really quickly about sydney she's talking about the lemons the lemons actually came to my house and lived in my at my previous house oh that's many that's years. right i forgot about that and yeah, they probably I, I were happier there too they were much happy yeah they were, they were fine yeah so this is um when we were filling the area. So as I mentioned, we built another wall in front. You can see that wall. We ended up extending it later on, uh, but that's us backfilling the, um, the whole area with dirt. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I drove my dad's truck to go get lo loads of dirt to put in that area. And Eric and I would hand shovel every little bit of it out into there. Uh, it was a lot of dirt moving, but uh, not as much dirt moving as you're going to see later. Um, but I always like this mid action shot of Eric um, shoveling dirt. Uh, moments later, he accidentally smacked the shovel into my dad's truck, and I had some explaining to do when I got home after that. Um, but there we are building the line up. Uh, you can see it's already been built up the side yard, and we're just starting to build the area uh, below the switchback. Uh, and then, obviously, on the right, you see our temporary tail track at the top there, where the number 10 is precariously perched out on a stack of bricks, and then uh, you see below that us uh, starting to construct the switchback and putting in the rest of the uh, log branch in the upper area that became so uh, iconic on that piece of railroad. Switchbacks are rarely modeled on layouts anywhere, so it was really cool to have one there. Yeah. Yeah, it was very operationally interesting. And, you know, the thing about uh, other than, you know, when you put a lot of cars behind a live steam geared engine, you really wouldn't see them work that much until you put them on that grade because it was somewhere around a six or seven percent grade. So it really actually made the equipment work, which was kind of neat to see. So really neat, really neat. 
Um, so we continued with lettering that year. We put a lot of decals on locomotives. This is when the engines finally started getting lettering was around that time. And then we also had been starting to read articles about uh, kit bashing and upscaling equipment. Uh, believe it or not, narrow gauge railroads had a lot of different size equipment. Uh, not everything looked the same. And a big proponent of this was uh, Kevin Strong, who models the Tuscarora Railroad in the East Broadtop. He lives out in Colorado. Um, and his articles really inspired me to start um, upscaling some of our other equipment, redetailing it and making it look um, like older narrow gauge equipment that would have been really beaten and worn down at that point. Um, and so uh, that's exemplified by the 467 over there on the left, which is the first such car we did in that style. We also had the arrival that year of the Malay, which was another crowd favorite, the logging Malay, which is based off of a engine that was never actually built, a narrow gauge version of a logging Malay that uh, was scheduled to be built right before the Great Depression. So I always find that engine kind of neat because it was built off of something that has blueprints but never actually existed in the real world. And then uh, we got our second live steam engine at that time. A friend of ours uh, who also worked at Roaring Camp with me um had this live steam engine offered it at a very good price and it was the kind of the first larger live steam engine we got it took a lot of work to get all shaped up and running correctly but that's the mogul there um and it was it's a really wonderful locomotive and uh was very rewarding for me to finally uh tick off my list getting a larger live steam engine at that time so 2018 was also the year that I went off to college. Um, and this kind of presented a bit of a challenge for the railroad because I wasn't going to be around there uh, day in and day out working on it. And I wanted to find ways that I could still, you know, contribute to the railroad, uh, not just on my breaks, because obviously I'd be home for summer and, you know, Christmas vacation and all that. But I wanted to find some way to contribute to the railroad beyond that. Uh, so unlike most college students that go out and, you know, party on their weekends and uh, hang out with friends, I decided to build models. And um, I actually brought this caboose up. And again, I mentioned Kevin Strong. That was an article in Garden Railways by him that I based this off of and upscaled this caboose uh, slowly but surely picking away on it when I didn't have schoolwork or obligations at Oregon Coast Scenic Railroad because that was the time I got involved there. Um, and over the course of about uh, two years, ended up building uh, this caboose up. I finally completed it in 2020. Um, it was a long haul to get there. Again, a huge learning process because it was my first scratch build, but something I'm still to this day very, very proud of. And here it was in the uh, paint booth, so to speak, getting finished. And there it was on the first day it ever set foot on the Fern Creek and Western all completed. So 2019 was the year of more rebuilding. Um, so <laughs> we realized after getting all these live steam locomotives and bigger cars and all that, not only did we need to widen curves, but we needed to ease grades a little bit uh, and improve on our track work. So um, you see me there on the left uh, installing a new bridge in the front yard. Uh, we did a lot of bridge upgrades that year and easing of the grades to make it easier on the locomotives. And then we also kind of uh, started developing the front yard into something more with an engine service facility and even a uh, tunnel that allowed for a reversing loop. You see here on the next slide, there's that tunnel right there. Um, we really tried to start making uh, the railroad not only uh, more visually interesting, but this is when we finally started to get the inkling that we really wanted to do something with operations was about this time. And so we started trying to develop the railroad more into an operations-based layout at this point. You can see in the backyard there, um, which is that big photo on the left, we had a, another engine service facility there and a Y that curved over the patio. Uh, this Y proved to be an absolute operational nightmare. Um, I don't think we ever made it over it without having derailments more than a couple of times. Um, it was a real operational headache, but, um, again, lots of expansion, lots of rebuilding. Uh, and this is again, when we really started, uh, centralizing in on this idea of wanting to do operations. 2019 was also the first year, uh, that we did a live steam up. Um, this probably goes down in history as one of the greatest Fern Creek and Western events that's ever happened, uh, for a number of reasons. But, um, uh, we just had a wonderful time. All these friends of ours brought over 
locomotives. I think there was a total of 10 engines. So uh, in that photo, you see Charlie there on the far right, Eric, um, Kevin and I in the front, and then uh, Nick Wright, Paul, and our friend Goofy Gary over there on the left. Um, everyone had a wonderful time during that event. Uh, it was a great opportunity to get all these live steam engines together and have a great time with friends on this newly rebuilt railroad. We had just kind of been starting to test out. Um, and, um, this was where the famous fireball incident happened with Charlie's <laughs> little engine, uh, where Charlie, uh, lit off a locomotive with a hot burner and, uh, flashed a huge fireball in his face, uh, that you could see from the front yard. You could see the reflection in the backyard from the front yard. And, um, his first reaction was, is my mustache okay? Um, cause he wanted to make sure his mustache hadn't been singed off. And I think his wife Taylor was kind of, uh, hoping it had been singed off. Uh, <laughs> I was looking at it right when it happened to it. <laughs> Big fire. Oh, and you right can tell, you can tell them about, uh, me, uh, nearly falling off the hill. Falling off the hill. Remind nearly I, stumbling yeah. over the kids. Remember, remember that? Oh yeah. Well, Trevor was so shocked by the incident that he, uh, he nearly fell over and I, I, I did you uh i don't know you maybe you said some colorful language too but there uh, was some colorful language said in, in front of some people that should not in have front heard of some, some colorful people, language yeah. Yep, yep. There, were, there was a lot of colorful language that day and i managed to keep all of it out of the video because yeah I, I was there and made a video of that it was the uh, first annual steam up and it was like the five-year anniversary I, I remember because I made two little medallion logos for the intro of that video, and it's in the playlist if anybody's interested in watching it. It's yeah, it's it's a it's one of the best videos of oh, the yeah. railroad out there. It was such a fun event. Um, my fun. Favorite? You might even said it was my, one of my favorite ones. <laughs> yeah, um, and then I also include on the bottom right the SP8 um, Gary Perazzo at the end of this event, um, he brought, so that engine is owned by Gary and, uh, the, uh, he brought them over. He had one other locomotive, which ended up coming to the Fern Creek and Western later on in its life also. Um, but, um, Gary, um, is, had this engine that didn't run very well. And, um, he said, well, why don't you guys keep it for a while and, uh, see if you can tune up and make it run nicely which we did and it ended up becoming the best live steam engine hands down that we had. It is an awesome engine. It pulls like 10 car. We pull 10 cars up the hill in front. No problem. I mean, just a absolutely behemoth live steam locomotive. And uh, we have a huge debt of gratitude to owe to Gary for his generosity and letting us keep that locomotive, even now after the railroad has um, uh, uh, gone by the wayside. But uh, that engine became a staple of the Fern Creek and Western. This was the day it arrived and started staying there. Uh, later that year, during one of our open houses, we also enveloped another Fern Creek and Western tradition, like the first time of ever doing this, of the longest train ever. This became a Fern Creek and Western tradition nearly every open house we did after this, where we would pile every piece of rolling stock we could possibly grab into the train, uh, put as many you know good locomotives on the train as we could find and try to get it over the railroad. I think this first one was somewhere around like uh, 24, 25 cars. And the last one we did was up in the high 40s, I believe. Um, so we, we always tried to top ourselves every year and put more cars on the train. You know, a lot of the time it worked really well. And then other times ended up in epic derailments and, you know, cars over on their side and tons of casualties and stuff like that. Um, but it was later that year that we decided that all the rebuilding we had done was not satisfactory. Um, and we wanted something more. We wanted to ease the grades more, put in wider curves and really do a rebuild of the railroad that was substantial. Um, and so you can see here, Eric and I measuring and laying out some track for what would become the big rebuild that we did in 2020. Um, and then after we started laying it out and I, I kind of posed the idea I had to Eric and Eric started measuring and went, mm, this might work. And, uh, then we started laying out some more track and, um, some PVC pipe to figure out the curvature and all that. And, uh, there was Paul standing there looking like, oh my God, what are you asking us to build? Um, and, uh, it was at this point that once we had kind of laid it all out, we figured out 
yeah, this is what we want. This is going to be the ultimate rebuild of the railroad. And so that led to the ultimate rebuild in 2020. You know, we rebuilt in 2017 and 2018 and 2019, but this was going to be the ultimate one. And it kind of did end up being the ultimate one. We made some changes after that big rebuild, but this ended up being kind of the big changeover of the railroad to what it became as seen in the layout tour. Um, so another great proud moment other than building the log branch was getting Eric to rip out the stupid bush that sat on the side of the house next to the tree fern that everyone would run into and everyone would trip over. And there's Eric after he told me, I think we need to rip the bush out. And I was like, it's about time. And he pulled the root ball out. Uh, and you can see he's quite happy there. And I don't know where the change of heart came from, but it didn't matter. I was happy with it. Um, and then on the right <laughs> was the big dirt delivery. So I showed you the photos of the uh, deliveries in the truck. Well, uh, we dumped 10 yards of dirt in Eric's front yard uh, with a dump truck. And I remember him calling me on the morning that it happened. Uh, because I wasn't there and the dump truck is there and the dirt was so wet it got stuck in the dump bed because he couldn't lift up high enough due to the phone lines. And Eric was freaking out on the phone about how they couldn't dump the dirt in the front yard. And it was going to be a total disaster. Uh, and I don't remember how they ended up getting it out, but there they are after it finally had been dumped in the front yard. His entire driveway was taken up with dirt. Um, and yet he still has a smile on his face. So um, we decided as we were deciding to, uh, you know, build this whole thing, that it was going to take too much time to um, move the dirt on our own because 10 yards of dirt is a lot of dirt to move wheelbarrow by wheelbarrow. So we hired two guys um, whose names are escaping me at the moment, and I remember them earlier today. Um, but um, we hired them, and they helped move all the dirt, pack it in, uh, get it situated. So Eric and myself... Uh, Paul and my dad all worked with them to do this. And we moved all that dirt and sculpted the entire landform for the front yard portion of the railroad in a single day, uh, which is something I'm still proud of and still don't know how we entirely pulled off. Because uh, it was quite like the 10, Herculean effort. Yeah, that's like 10 miles in one day on the Transcon, right? Yep. Yep. That was uh, probably the most work we've done. That was a long, long day. And it was wetter than hell everything all the dirt was still wet and so as we were tamping it and shoveling it we were having to spray the shovels and tampers with uh you know pan spray you know like uh, cooking oil so that all the dirt wouldn't stick yeah. to all the tools maybe talk about the uh, guideposts and how we how we explain you know what level it should be to our, our workers that were helping us oh yeah so um that's a really good point paul um the the posts that are in the ground had marks on them and we ended up uh, you'll see in a minute here the laser level but we ended up leveling out all this area with a laser level to get all the elevations right because it turned out the front yard actually had a slight slope down to the street which we didn't really know about you couldn't see it with the naked eye but it did have a slope the laser level um, was really helpful <laughs> yes it was and um Anyway, we um, we had all these posts marked basically on the trajectory of the track, and they were marked at the levels. And you know, they knew they knew they needed to have a constant slope between the two points, and that also instructed them where to put all of the clay versus the topsoil and all that. Basically, I like to think of it like they built a big moat essentially out of clay and then filled the middle with topsoil. And we were there helping and directing. You can see how in that bottom right photo, Eric is shoveling there, and Paul's moving rocks around and. Um, uh, you know, obviously at the end of the day, we were test fitting track. So that was basically how we instructed how to do all the um, work was through those grade posts. And those grade posts stayed in for quite some time to get everything right and get the track all tamped up to the correct levels and all that. Um, but another cool thing happened in 2020, uh, which was entering into the picture Gary Lee. Uh, Gary Lee helped us with a lot of construction of buildings and bridges uh, because uh, we quickly realized as we were doing this whole railroad rebuild um, that um, we were going to need some custom bridges for this ordeal because uh, a stock bridge off the shelf from Bridgemasters was not going to cut it for uh, the type of track geometry we were wanting to accomplish. Um, and we also were starting to realize as we were getting into 1 to 20.3, we were going to need scratch built structures. 
um, because no one virtually makes any structures in 1 to 20.3. Gary lives up in Oregon um, outside of Portland, um, and he has his own railroad called the Baker and Grand Ron, uh, which is a 1 to 24 scale railroad. Uh, you can see a picture of that on the right-hand side that was taken during the National Garden Railway Convention in 2019. Uh, absolutely gorgeous railroad. Uh, Gary is a NMRA recognized master model railroader and one of only two, I believe, uh, in the garden railroad world that's a master model railroader. Um, and uh, just absolutely beautiful craftsmanship um, and all that on his railroad. But the thing that really sets Gary apart is he is willing to open up his shop to me um, and teach me how to do all the construction of these bridges and uh, structures. And Gary proved to be an absolutely invaluable asset in the Fern Creek and Western. And uh, so this was the era when we first started, I first started getting involved with Gary to uh, build stuff. And this was the first structure we built. This was in early 2020 um, as we were building the big engine house that ended up sitting in the backyard. And so this kind of shows some of the construction of that engine house in his shop where I got to learn how to scratch build stuff. But of course, uh, this was in March of 2020. And so I was still in college at that point. And uh, when COVID really started uh, hitting, uh, the school shut down and I ended up going home uh, and basically being kicked out of school. And so that photo on the very bottom right is my car packed to the brim with crap out of my dorm room that I had to move out because we didn't know if we were going to come back. And in the little left-hand corner of my trunk is the engine house all collapsed into that little tiny corner for the transport trip all the way down to California from Oregon, which is something I always just, I always have to laugh at when I see these photos. I have all my worldly possessions uh, for living in dorms in that car and also my garden scale engine house that I had to get back down with me because that was like the most important thing to transport undamaged. It's all about the priorities, man. Right. Um, <clears throat> and so there's the engine house once it was actually completed. Uh, my dad and I, I wish I'd include a photo of this now, but my dad and I uh, in the evening sat there and individually applied every single shingle to that roof. So, you know, if you want to talk about going crazy during COVID, that will drive you crazy, uh, putting shingles on roofs all the time. But it was a nice father-son father project and a good way to pass the time during lockdowns. I think we included a picture of you guys putting the shingles on on the ultimate layout tour. In, it, there is morning. one in the layout tour, yes. Yeah. Uh, but speaking of my dad, um, he proved to be a, another invaluable asset in this whole um, construction process of the ultimate you know, uh, railroad rebuild. And, um, you know, Eric loved him to death, but I don't know how the guy passed geometry. Um, <laughs> you know, he, uh, his spatial relationship was not always the best and, uh, he had a hard time visualizing things on paper and would, uh, was more attuned to just putting it down and seeing how it would work. He and, would always uh, give me the tape measure and say, here, you measure it. <laughs> yeah. I always screw up when I measure things. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. that was, uh, that was true. And, um, and so my dad uh, is a designer by trade and uh, he, uh, I, I enlisted him to help us construct this whole garden box in the side yard and all the great elevations and all that. And he was uh, so valuable for this project and so patient with trying to help Eric understand what exactly we were trying to achieve on paper. Um, and so uh, you see there in the top right, there's that laser level we were talking about leveling everything out. The best tool you can ever have for a garden railroad is a laser level. Trust me, it is absolutely invaluable. Um, so he drew it all up on paper. We got all the great elevations on paper, started constructing it, laid track, leveled track on those grade posts. We rebuilt the log line. And as a matter of fact, one thing I'll mention on this is that um, the fence you see is brand new in this. At the very beginning of COVID, Eric had a guy come in and build the fence who was a very interesting character. And um, it turned out, though, that in building the new fence, the property line was slightly further over and they built the fence more on the neighbor's side. And we ended up gaining about six inches. So basically uh, that entire four by four post width and a little bit more, we ended up gaining um, for the log branch. And so with all this newfound room, it doesn't sound like much, but it was a it was a big deal to gain six inches. Um, so we uh, ended up rebuilding the whole log branch at this time. Uh, too, because we wanted to, uh, again, expand the operations up there and make it more interesting. Before, everything in there was just straight track, 
very straightforward, but we ended up putting in all these nice flowing curves and stuff to make it look very branch line logging railroad esque, if you will. Um, and if you're really interested in learning the details of this 2020 rebuild, uh, how we built the garden box and all that, not only can you check out the layout tour, but there's also a video called Fern Creek and Western Test Day in that playlist uh, that talks about the 2020 rebuild in really great depth about how we did everything. Um, and then on the right there, uh, that's the temporary bridge we had and engine nine, which was the last new engine we ever had arrive at the railroad, another C-19, which ended up being my favorite locomotive of all of our electric engines. Absolutely awesome engine. So there's some more of the garden box construction. That's the first train over the garden box and all the track we had put in there. And um, then we <laughs> like moved that. on to building the stuff that ended up getting torn out again. I know that sounds kind of complicated, but anyone who's an astute viewer of the Fern Creek and Western will notice that the log pond is still located up against the house in this shot. And we're laying in track for an engine service facility here that would end up becoming the town. The main line of the railroad really stayed the same at this point after the big rebuild, but uh, siding still moved all over the place basically till the very end uh, when we finally kind of locked down something we liked around 2022. Um, and, uh, and there's, you see Paul citing track there. And, uh, I just find it funny <laughs> again, put all this work into something, uh, that, uh, you know, we ended up tearing up and rebuilding again after this and, uh, Sparky, that water tower is far, far out of sight. We were expecting you to come by. So we made sure to hide it. Um, and then on the right, um, uh, just wanted to point out 2020 also was the era in which two other very important people got involved in the Fern Creek and Western. At the very top there is Daniel. Daniel uh, ended up uh, coming to help us around the end of 2020. He was a co-worker of mine at Roaring Camp. Um, and Daniel is one of those people that basically you give him a task um, and you say, build this, and Daniel can do it. Uh, he's one of those guys that is uh, very intelligent, very uh, mechanically oriented, uh, and uh, just, you know, absolutely willing to, you know, put in the sweat equity that it takes and come up with inventive solutions to problems. Um, so another guy who was an invaluable resource over the years for us. And then down below Lauren, uh, Lauren is my girlfriend. Uh, again, another coworker from Roaring Camp. Um, and uh, Lauren started hanging out when she, uh, you know, wanted to hang out around me before we started dating, if you will. Uh, but then once we started dating, I was like, all right, well, here's the real girlfriend test. We're going to make you work on the railroad. And we're still together. So apparently uh, she's a keeper. So 2021 is uh, kind of an era of trials and tribulations with modeling. We'd kind of been burnt out on rebuilding the railroad by this point, And we wanted to get our hands on some models and actually do some modeling work. But uh, a lot of them were very finicky projects. Uh, this was the river from hell, as I call it, uh, building this river in the backyard, which leaked over and over and over again. It took me months upon months to chase all the leaks out of it. Absolute headache, um, but ended up becoming a really neat scenic feature that looked very realistic in the end. Um, <coughs> excuse me. And um, we also acquired, um, excuse me, I'm going to drink a little bit of water here. I, I do want to mention I, about the uh, 2020 rebuild. I, I, I'm pretty sure that was the longest time that the railroad was disconnected, if I'm remembering correctly. Yeah, that's correct. Um, it, it was, it was, um, I think it was about uh, eight months or nine months that the, the main line was not yeah, in one I, piece. I remember near the end there, we were all kind of looking at each other, especially Eric. We we're like, we don't know if this thing's ever going to, get back together again. <laughs> yeah. Mean, there was yeah. A, there, there was, was where, definitely frustrated yeah, at that time, but between we were, COVID yeah. and, yeah. you know, that COVID gave us more time, but, but in well, you're, my, you're back from school. So we had extra in, time. That, yeah. And then, but also yeah. in my line of work at Roaring Camp, there was a lot more to do because we were running more trains for less people. And then not to mention the fire that happened that and year. And the fire. Too. Yeah. Yep, yeah. The fire. So, Wasn't 2020 the year? Because I remember when I when we were putting together the or when I was putting together the, the layout tour, there was one year that I had almost nothing in because nothing happened there. Was it 2020? That is 2021. Oh, okay. And uh, there's a reason for that, which I'm going to get to in a minute. Um, 
so again, 2021 was a lot of what I like to call piddly construction, doing a lot of small projects and that sort of thing. So I talked about the river. One of them was um, uh, I acquired this live steam shea. Live steam shea is something I'd always wanted since I discovered garden railroading because I love shays. I worked on real shays at Roaring Camp. Um, and uh, I acquired this one from AccuCraft as an engine that had some issues. It had a lot more issues than we thought. Um, and Charlie is there trying to time it. Um, we went through all sorts of issues trying to figure out what was wrong with this engine. Got the timing right, and then the water glass was plugged up and uh, ended up snapping a water glass fitting off in the boiler, and it was just a huge ordeal to get it running again. Um, so that took up a lot of my time in 2021, probably more than it should have. Uh, but over on the other side of the table, you see Paul working on his piddly project. Um, we had a lot of cars we were wanting to repaint and re-letter, and he decided to tackle what I would call the hardest one first. Uh, because it had all sorts of broken detail parts and all sorts of other issues uh, that you can probably speak to, Paul. But that was uh, uh, quite the undertaking for you as well. Yeah, it was a, uh, a Florence and Cripple Creek uh, boxcar that we wanted to repaint in uh, kind of an oxide red color and letter for the Fern Creek and Western to have another Fern Creek and Western boxcar. And, you know, this boxcar, besides just being the wrong color and having uh, the wrong logos on it and stuff, um, it had a, like somebody had tried to re-glue the uncoupling lever on the B end and uh, there was just a huge like glob of super glue and I had to chip it away and re-sand the car down and recut the the wood grooves that the super glue got in and it was just a total mess on the end of the car. I think we installed like missing bolts and stuff on it and uh, it turned out to be a lot more than just a simple paint and prime and, and decal job but uh, I think it, it turned out pretty awesome in the end. Yep that sure did um, and this was also the year we started uh, the log car project of uh, taking Bachman log cars and putting extensions in them um, <clears throat> so basically there's this company that makes resin extensions that you can put in these log cars to make them scale length for 1 to 20.3 but we also wanted to do some more detailing on the car. So this shows one of the cars we had fully detailed. We didn't do more than one of them, I think, with all the detail. We did minor detail on all the other ones. Uh, different trucks, uh, repainted them, all that sort of stuff. Again, another project that took a ridiculous amount of time, but uh, came out with a really good result in the end. Uh, Paul and Daniel, uh, once I had done the initial cutting and installing of the uh, um extensions actually kind of took the lead and did a lot of the work on uh, this one. Yeah. Um, yeah. Daniel and I, uh, we received, uh, Trevor had uh, contacted a guy to make us some 3d printed trucks. they were actually copies of uh, Bachman uh, trucks, but they were sprung. And uh, when we received them, we had to sand a lot of the flashing down and, and that was quite a few pairs of trucks. So that took us a good couple days just to clean those up. And then after that, um, we went through and, you know, painted and primed all the cars and, uh, I scratch built a few, uh, new bunks on the cars cause someone had super glued logs to them in a previous life and destroyed the bunks. And then, uh, one thing that we, we never quite figured out with these cars is that the resin centerpiece, although very cool, uh, never took paint quite right. And, uh, we just kind of you know, put it down to spraying as many layers as we could and uh if someone anyone has a solution for for slippery resin paint that would that would be good because it never quite stuck to it yeah resin is one of those things that i know people build like resin kits and stuff and they have their methods of cleaning them before putting uh, paint on them and we did clean them with soap and water and stuff soap like and that water, but yeah. we never there must be something else because we didn't figure it out yeah it's it's not like 3d printing resin it's different yeah yeah did you try sanding it to give it a slightly rough surface so the paint had something to it? There's so much intricate detail on it. You wouldn't because you'd, you'd screw up the wood grain doing that. Um, hmm. And also there's bolt detail all over that thing. Yep. So um, I was thinking be, of painting it in super glue or something. maybe. Yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, so then that same year, um, again, back to Lauren, um, uh, we ended up embarking on the Climax 6 project, which we finally completed in 2023 toward the very end of the railroad's existence. Um, this was an engine uh, that needed a whole lot of work um, and ended up moving to Oregon with us when we 
ended up moving up here uh, full time. Um, we did everything to this engine that we could possibly think of. Um, and if you go to part four of the um, uh, Blue Nami install video that we did on John's Climax, you can see this engine in a lot greater detail. There's also a pretty good segment about it in the layout tour as well, where it talks about it. But this is a stock Bachman Climax that's been totally tricked out. Um, and it was a great project uh, to work on with Lauren to teach her locomotive super detailing and stuff like that. And there it is fully complete uh, when it was all weathered and detailed up. Just a really cool looking engine. So 2022 is when I like to say we finished the 2020 rebuild. Um, so um, you can see here, this was the start of the construction of the large bridge that went in front. I mentioned Gary Lee, um, you know, had helped me build the engine house and he was going to help me build bridges, but COVID happened. I had to leave Oregon and didn't get back up to Oregon until the end of 2021. And so um, at that point, we finally got a design for the bridge, started building it. Um, and uh, you can see here, uh, one of Gary's famous one liners is you can never have enough clamps. And if this picture does not prove that, I don't know what does. Uh, it, the, the guy's got bucketfuls of clamps, uh, but they're invaluable for building these bridges. Um, and uh, we ended up uh, building this bridge over a period of about uh, six or seven months or so. Um, and um, you can see Lauren there uh, she, when she would come and visit me in Oregon because we were dating long distance at that time. She was working on her own project, um, building a water tower, um, uh, out of scratch built water tower. And there she is with her fully completed water tower when she had finished it sometime in uh, mid-2022. <clears throat> uh, the other big kind of project we were working on to complete the 2020 rebuild was uh, the installation of the log pond in front. And this is when we finally uh, got the track design finalized. I mentioned Paul citing that track. You know, he was uh, um, uh, looking at something that essentially would get ripped up eventually. And this is when we finally decided on how we wanted to do the log pond and all that and the track arrangement. And this really there is when we got the final rendition of how the track layout was going to go for Fern Creek and Western uh, down in, in um, uh, Parkston. And so um, this shows us building the pond. Uh, we learned a lot from the first one because the second pond we built was a whole lot better. Second river we built was a whole lot better. Uh, learned a lot from the first one and employed those tactics on this one. And you can see Paul there in the bottom right installing the track that uh, runs along the rock wall there, which was to eliminate some really tight curves we had and just ended up being a really good decision to put that track in, uh, except for the fact that it got stepped on very regularly in that spot, which was a bit of an issue. Yeah, I think I replaced it about three times. <laughs> um, but remember how I was talking about burning the midnight oil and how uh, we had a lot of last minute projects at Fern Creek? Well, I think this one might take the cake. Well, actually, no, the sawmill takes the cake, and we're about to get to that. But um, Again, I'm in Oregon at this point. I had accepted a job at Oregon Coast Scenic Railroad as the operations supervisor by this point. And um, we built the whole bridge in Oregon and then transported it down to California. I figured out that you could build boxes and transport them in checked luggage on the plane and not get charged extra if you flew by Southwest, um, Southwest Airlines. So I ended up building boxes uh, to put the bridge components in. We transported them to California, picked them up off the, you know, luggage carousel at the airport. Um, uh, the questions when, you know, they ask you what's in the bag, you say, oh, a scale bridge. They kind of look at you a little funny. Um, but we brought it down uh, about four or five days before an open house, installed it, and you see Eric, Paul, and I installing the bridge there. It arrived with some damage, and we had to do the final assembly all down there, which and things didn't quite fit together the way they were supposed to in a couple spots. And Yeah, the assembly a, took longer, I think, than we thought. <laughs> yeah, it, there was a lot of things that didn't quite fit right, because we were kind of rushing at the end uh, to get it done for that open house. But we did install it, um, and uh, uh, then I flew back to Oregon to work for a few days and then flew back down again for the open house, missed the flight on the way down uh, and arrived like, you know, 10 minutes before the open house started to put the finishing touches on the bridge. Uh, so <laughs> that ain't so, the... Uh, dude, you were so stressed that day. <laughs> yeah, I was in a terrible mood that day too. But 
Brit, the bridge was just such a cool project. I mean, it is one of the nicest garden railroad bridges that I've ever seen, uh, in my opinion, anyway. I mean, it 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 was a really long and detailed process to build it correctly, um, but it ended up just fitting the area so well, and it looked natural. That was the thing about it that was really neat, was that um, a lot of the bridges looked like stock bridges we had just plopped in. This one was built to that spot and really flowed nicely with the track plan. I just remember seeing it from out in the street for the first time with the train on it. And we were like, wow, this, this just looks right. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And fitting it in, and, and, and I should mention that uh, the, uh, in the uh, kind of uh, very left-hand side of that photo on the left, there's that tree trunk coming up there. That was a tree fern that was there um, that Eric absolutely adored. And it was the bane of my existence. Um, I, Built getting the bridge to fit around that tree fern and not obstruct the lower track below it took so many renditions of the design. And we at some point said, Eric, why don't we just rip the tree fern out? Absolutely not. We'll never do that. Blah, 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 blah. And I got a whole uh, line of uh, anger out of even suggesting that we rip the tree fern out. So we had to build the bridge around it, which is part of why it took so long to design. You, you were hoping for the bush part two? Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, and then there's the first train on that open house, you know, first full size train on it. So that was pretty exciting. Um, we also did the first operating session right after that, uh, fairly soon after that. And I just want to briefly touch on why operations, um, you know, we, um, we'd always had this intention of doing operating, um, on this railroad. Um, and Paul, um, and I both had the really, really unique opportunity to be regular operators on the late Jim Vale's Glenwood and Black Creek HON3 Railroad, uh, which was located in Santa Cruz uh, County. Uh, to answer that question below, the bridge was made out of uh, clear red cedar. Um, so um, anyway, we operated Jim Vale's Railroad. That's where we learned operations. And um, I quickly just want to honor Jim because he was the one that really introduced us to operations and, you know, let 12, 13 year old kids in on a full blown chime table and train order operating session at his layout, which was a world renowned model railroad. Um, and so Jim was the guy who taught us ops and inspired us to do it on our own railroad. And so I just wanted to quickly touch on the fact that Jim was the inspiration for this. And Paul is the one to thank for the fact that we got to meet Jim because his grandfather was close with him. Yeah, my my grandfather, I think, uh, met Jim at one of the Elks Clubs events here in Santa Cruz. And, uh, and my grandpa mentioned one day, he's like, yeah, there's this guy in Santa Cruz who has a train layout. We should go see it, Paul. And little did I know what I was getting myself into when I was invited to, you know, master model railroad or Jim Bale's house. And uh it was just like the coolest layout I've ever seen in my life. Yeah. And I'm, I'm very fortunate. Uh, He's another great uh, example of someone that was very generous to young people. I was thinking um, that too. Jim, Jim has the same mentality as Eric. He was glad to help us with any train projects. And anytime we wanted to, we could call him up and say, hey, Jim, can we run the layout? And he'd say, sure. So, yep. Absolutely. Yeah. He was a really yeah. unique uh, individual and so many great railroad stories so many great pieces in his collection. Anyone that knows Jim Vale's layout will see this photo of the uh, Malay running and realize this is a very rare photo um, because uh, that Malay never made it out very often. I ran it one time. <laughs> yeah, I think you were running it in this in this photo, actually. Maybe. Um, but, uh, but yeah, Jim passed away in 2018. Uh, and if you're interested in his layout, another TSG video, there's a layout tour of his layout, which is a really incredible, comprehensive look of his layout. So 2022 was kind of also the beginning of the end, as I like to call it. Um, that was the last time we did Halloween. So other than 2020, we did Halloween every single year. Um, but uh, 2022 was the last year we did Halloween. Um, so these are photos from the last one. And I just want everyone, if you are just tuning in or, um, you know, remember back to kind of the beginning of the presentation, we showed the first Halloween. And this shows you how much it developed from that it really became quite the ordeal with well over a thousand people attending every single halloween uh it was insane but uh it was a really memorable uh experience something we really looked forward to every year 
I'm going to say something about the Halloween. I remember, Trevor. I don't remember what year it was. It was probably around 2018. You invited me to that. And you're like, oh, yeah, there's, there's like a, a huge crowd of people show up here. And I was kind of like, yeah, okay, whatever. Thinking, yeah, can't be that many. I mean, like you said about when Eric told you about his neighborhood. And I remember going down there. I was like, holy crap. Like, I remember like they're only giving away one piece of candy. They they have to only give away one piece of candy because they'll run out of candy. There were so many people there. It was just a massive, huge. It was like going to a concert or something. That's how many people yeah. would show up at this thing. And and there's there's a few years of Halloween that are documented on your channel somewhere. So if someone wants to find the link for that or or look it up, I think it might even be in the playlist too. Yeah, there's the, a couple of years that document Halloween. There's uh, one Halloween was our. Oh. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say there is one video I think that's a standalone video in that playlist, and I think it might have been from this last year, uh, twenty two. But uh, every other time it was in uh, podcast segments. So if people watch the TSG podcast from you know November of whatever year, uh, they'll probably see Fern Creek and Western Halloween because it was a real <clears throat> spectacle. <laughs> Yes. I was just going to say was. that uh, Halloween was the time that uh, Trevor and I got to have a bit of fun. We're both former theater lighting technicians. I did it uh, professionally for a while in Santa Cruz. And uh, it was our chance every year to have a bit of fun and kind of do our own sort of theater lighting thing or, you know, production. We got to, you know, paint a whole bunch of gravestones and just have fun with yeah. spider webs. Animatronics but, everywhere. Lights, animatronics. Fog machines, she loved those. You know, yeah. Was... Fog machines. Yeah. It was uh, quite the production every year. Quite the production, yeah. So, um, so then, of course, 2023, the most challenging year of the railroad's existence, because obviously this is the year where Eric passes away. Um, so per that op session, we ended up doing a lot of rebuilding of uh, the yards and stuff on the railroad, eliminating some tracks, adding some tracks in different places to... Um, basically uh, fulfill the wishes and suggestions of our test operators from October of 22 um, and uh, make the railroad even better. And this was also leading up to the National Garden Railway Convention of 2023, which happened the uh, first week of July of 2023. So we were building things like crazy by this point. Uh, the tunnel you see there um, was kind of the final piece of the bridge. It included an abutment for the bridge in front and the tunnel portal so that it scenic to the area going into the garden box. You see below that uh, the beginnings of the Upper Fern Creek Bridge, which is a uh, skewed uh, uh, King Post Trust Bridge that we built. Uh, again, with Gary Lee, all that was built with Gary Lee. And then the bottom one was Lauren's project building a sand house for the engine service facility at Fern Creek. Um, and this shows you some of the completed stuff that came from that. There's Lauren's sand house on the left, and then Daniel and I installing the upper Fern Creek bridge and the first train going over it. The big thing, though, that Eric always wanted, um, and he said this to me time and time again, was I want the sawmill. Um, and, uh, by about, uh, late April, uh, or early May of 2022, we realized that Eric was not going to be with us forever. And, um, also that the national garden railway convention was coming close and we just, Gary Lee and I decided that we were going to get the sawmill done before the national convention. Um, and so there's us building it in his shop. We cut it out of plywood, framed the whole thing, had a guy, uh, Joe Eckert, laser engrave the building, all the windows, uh, laser cut all the windows and that sort of stuff. Uh, and that photo on the left, top left, is a really important photo. Um, it might just be, you know, me holding the wall up, but that's the last photo I ever sent to Eric when he was still alive. Um, and Eric died about two days after that photo was taken. And um, it was his dream to see the sawmill uh, completed. And uh, it was something, unfortunately, he never got to see. And I didn't make it in time, you know, to, to build it in time to, for him to see it. It's a, one of, it's a regret, um, no question about it. And um, so that's a significant photo to me just because that was the state Eric got to see it in. He at least knew we were trying to complete it and getting it done for the convention. Um, and so after that, Gary and I had 
you know, a real motivation to get it done in his honor because it was a lot of work to pull off. I was coming over there after work nearly every day, staying there till 11 o'clock at night, trying to finish this thing. Um, Gary pulled ungodly hours trying to help me with this thing and, um, you know, work on it on his own when I had to be at work, um, went above and beyond the call of duty, um, to help us complete this. And so Gary, uh, if you're watching, thank you <laughs> because it uh, would not have gotten done without your guidance and your time. Um, so we built this whole thing. And meanwhile, while we were slaving away on this thing up in Oregon, um, uh, you know, we brought it down, assembled it in this stage in California, again, flew it down on the plane, just like the bridge. Uh, so this was like, you know, a week before the open house for the national convention that it was in this state. And while we were doing this, the California crew of Daniel and Paul, uh, were, uh, vigorously working away on uh, repairing buildings and painting depots, uh, which I'm sure you can talk in some detail about Paul. Sure. Um, yeah, we, we, you know, on the majority of the railroad, I spent a lot of my time just working on track and like, you know, on cars and stuff. Uh, and uh, we kind of forgot about a lot of the buildings. Uh, that was more of Eric's thing for a while. And then when it, we came serious about wanting to make the railroad look professional, you know, Trevor got into scratch building. And from that point, you know, we had all these nice scratch belt buildings, but the rest of our plastic buildings didn't really measure up to what he had made. So we kind of had to kind of do some work that we, we've been uh, avoiding. So Daniel and I and uh, some other people took it upon ourselves to uh, kind of do what we could to make our depots look presentable. And uh, we painted, I think, uh, three depots and uh, two freight buildings. And it was a huge involvement uh, by Daniel uh, and myself and my mom. She was painting trim on the windows and uh, Justin Conklin and uh, Charlie, I think helped too. And then also Kevin Hill who did the signage um, on the buildings. It was uh, really a, a, a long project. And I think I was up till probably 3 a.m. the night before the, uh, the convention still painting trim on those windows. So, yeah. Speaking of being up till 3 a.m. the night before the convention, there was still work to be done at the sawmill at this point. This was the photo on the left is two days to convention time. That was taken in the Oregon Coast Scenic Railroad's Garibaldi shop at one o'clock in the morning after our first ever moonlight train. When after everyone went home, I went back into the shop and started working on my model because I needed a drill press to work off of. Um, and on the right, this is the ultimate burning the midnight oil story on the right. The models, the part of the model, which is the boiler house in that photo, which was the last piece to complete for to make the sawmill look halfway presentable is sitting in the uh, one of the conductor seats of Great Northern 274, uh, which is the F unit at Oregon Coast Scenic. I was the engineer on this night. It's the 4th of July fireworks train. The night before the National Garden Railway Convention, I was running the night train to Rockaway Beach with hundreds of passengers on board. And then once everyone disembarked the train to go and um, watch the fireworks for an hour and a half or whatever it was, I... Uh, moved into one of the passenger cars behind the locomotive, plopped down my modeling supplies and started working on the building, gluing um, uh, roof corrugated roof pieces on the night before the convention as the train is sitting in the depot, uh, <laughs> you know, waiting for all of our passengers to watch the fireworks and get back on board. We then took the train back to Garibaldi. I got off duty at like midnight, drove back home, stayed up all night, drove to the airport, once again missed my flight because it was the day after 4th of July, got on the next plane out with all the sawmill crap and uh, made it somehow to the National Convention Open House, set up the sawmill the rest of the way, and we were in business that day for the convention. But you know that, that is the ultimate. Do you know what's funny about that story too, Trevor? What? Is that F unit has been around a long time, probably 60 or 70 years. 1951. Right? Yeah. And I bet that was the only time in its entire life that it ever had someone building a model in it. 
Okay. Well, I didn't build the model in the locomotive. I want to make that very clear. I wasn't working on it while I was running the engine or anything oh, like that. No, no. But uh, when I we don't... stopped and the engine was tied up, then I went yeah. back on the train and did my thing. I don't mean that you were building it while it was running. I just mean it's probably the only model like that that's ever sat in the engine, you know, in its entire lifespan. That's just funny yeah. to me. It got to that's go awesome. through quite, <laughs> quite the ride. Yeah, I always, I always love telling that story. Um, so there we are on convention day. Uh, dirty little secret, though. The jack slip that uh, carries the logs up into the mill didn't get completed until a little bit later, as you can see in some of the other photos. But Gary thankfully was able to come all the way down from Oregon for the convention and see the railroad for himself and see all of the stuff he'd helped me build on the railroad in operation, see the sawmill. That was really a great full circle moment and really rewarding to be able to show Gary everything we'd built and have him meet everyone. Uh, really a special moment for me. Um, uh, unfortunately, he never got to meet Eric, but uh, really uh, just an absolutely full circle and it was great uh, to cool have moment. him. Yep. Yeah. And he actually got to operate at our operating session too during the convention. So that was great. You could tell he was having a really good time too. Oh yeah. Like, he, he loved I, it. Yeah. I talked to Gary a little bit that day and he was having a great time. Something else I want to mention, you know, the bridge that he helped you build was absolutely amazing. And I knew that was something special, but when you brought that sawmill down, and set that up, I was like, wow, that's equally better or equally good, you know, compared to the bridge, maybe yeah. better. I mean, the, the fact that it took up that much space in the front yard and it was so such a good model to me, it was like that when you brought the sawmill down, that became for me the centerpiece or the thing that drew my attention in the front yep. yard. Cause it's and that was always the intention of where it yeah. was placed, how it was built was that it would be the, centerpiece of the railroad because yeah. that's what the railroad wouldn't be there if it wasn't for the sawmill right you know in, right. in, that's in the reality biggest customer, i guess huh yeah so anyway after all this was over we were tired um and uh at, we were also kind of in this state of limbo of uh what was going to happen we knew the railroad was going to come down but how much longer could it live so we were really really thankful that my dad, who ended up being the um, executor of Eric's trust, um, uh, allowed us to do a few last events at the railroad. Um, and these are well documented through John's videos uh, of the, the Swan Song trilogy, as we call it, the last events of the railroad. But these are some photos from the last operating session we have. These all occurred in October of 2023. Um, the last open house we had um, and, uh, these photos, uh, the two of the engines are from, uh, Wes Little, who ended up becoming a really huge asset in the teardown of the railroad. Um, he's a younger guy, uh, who has a lot of potential in the model railroad world and the, uh, real railroad world who we were really uh, lucky to have involved at the very end. And I should point out, you remember that photo at the very beginning of Tom Shreve with us in front of the Heisler at Roaring Camp? Well, Tom Shreve ended up becoming one of my main mentors for steam locomotive operation and maintenance. And there he is with us in that middle photo on the right, visiting our garden railroad. Uh, another one of those full circle moments that I was so excited to have Tom there to see what we had created. Uh, he's been a, another life mentor to me and a very important person in my life. So um, that was just really cool to have someone from the real, you know, railroad world from my professional career um, uh, come and visit and take so much interest in it. He's a, a historian in his own right. And I think he really appreciated what we had created and how accurate it was. Then we also had the last live steam, of course, the ultimate uh, final event of the railroad. Another one really that was special for all of us. It was the last time we all got to be together at the railroad. Um, and we did a lot of things that we had wanted to do, like the geared triple header you see there and, and many other things which are documented in that video. Uh, to answer the question uh, below, um, the structures come in during the winter time. We would leave uh, a few plastic structures outside during the winter, um, but all the wood structures for sure came inside. Even when we weren't really running trains, they would generally come inside. But, but not the bridge though, right? No, the bridge. So yeah, the bridge, the bridge stayed out year round. And the reason for that is because the bridge is built out of clear milled cedar. The wooden buildings themselves have plywood walls that are framed with clear cedar on the inside. 
and uh, have you know battens and stuff on the outside. Um, and so that if that gets too wet, it'll start to uh, delaminate. So, um, I mean, they can stand outside in moisture, fog, that sort of thing. When it starts getting pretty wet, you want to, um, you know, end up, uh, uh, putting them inside and Sparky, we'll get to your question here in a moment because we're almost at the end of the presentation. So 2024, of course, was the end of the line. The railroad survived until about the second week of January of, uh, 2024. We ran it the last time the day before Christmas, I believe, or maybe it was a little after Christmas of 23. Um, but we didn't actually start taking up most of the track until after 2024 had begun. Um, this is well documented on our Facebook page of how we did this. Um, these are some shots we took of the rail removing train um, uh, on the log branch. And this was kind of a special one because that locomotive pulling the train, the number one there, was the engine pictured in that first photo of the first train that ever ran over our railroad. And there it is pulling the last train over our railroad. Um, now, truth be told, this was not the actual last train on the railroad. Um, the actual last train is kind of a neat Easter egg. Uh, in the layout tour, there's a video of uh, the camera sitting on the tender of Gary's live steam mogul to show how the servos power all of the valves in there and everything. And that was the actual last movement of a train on the Fern Creek and Western in that shot. Um, we started taking up the main line the next day. So that's kind of a neat Easter egg that if you're watching this, you now know. So uh, again, a lot of help from a lot of people made this possible. You see in that photo on the left, Justin Conklin on the left, Paul, obviously my dad, myself, Daniel, and then Wesley on the far right there. Uh, these people all worked tirelessly uh, for days on end to pack this railroad away. Um, I think we basically completed the entire operation in uh, just over two weeks. Uh, it was a Herculean effort uh, to move everything and uh, get it packaged and inventoried and cleaned and make sure it was put away right so that when the time comes for it to be taken out again, uh, we will be able to um, you know, just get it up and running and not have to be fixing things constantly. Um, on the right there, you see Daniel and Wes packing the sawmill. That shows you how those buildings collapsed down into a box and how we transported them on a plane. And in the bottom right, that's Paul and I taking up the first piece of track of the main line. There's a whole bunch of behind the scenes things throughout the years, usually as podcast segments. And one of them recently... I think I was out there in December. Yeah, it was in December when we came out to foam the lights train. And uh, you were showing how you're getting everything ready. Yep. Uh, it, you know, for getting packed up and inventorying. I, Lauren was there with the computer. and People can see that in the January podcast if they want to. I I do a thing with the podcasts now where I I set out or set out. I make a list of all the segments and what what's happening in each segment. So you can click right straight to it if you want to see that segment uh, yeah. of the behind the scenes of that. Yes, yeah, so that would have been the January 2024 right. podcast. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so when we were all done, this is how it looked. Um, you know, it was hard to see it like that for, for lack of a better term, I think for everyone. Um, Looks like World War One or something. Yeah, well, it was... <laughs> It was funny. We had this running joke. So one of the, we had actually a fifth, I believe, or maybe sixth live steam engine. I can't really remember. Um, but we had another live steam engine that was this little French trench engine. We never ran it. It was Eric's little thing. He bought it, um, you know, um, AccuCraft when he went there one time. And uh, <laughs> we ended up selling it to Kevin. Um, and he's now running it and loves the locomotive. Uh, but we always joked at the end of this that Kevin was talking about building a, a World War I trench railroad in his backyard at his new house. And uh, we were like, well, you could just buy this house, Kevin, and there's a trench railroad in there already for you. Um, <laughs> looks like a bunch of bombs went off. In the bombs went off. That's, that's yeah. where all the trees were taken out of. Yeah. And so yep. so the trees, um, you know, we, we went through great effort to save everything we could from the railroad. Uh, track locomotives, cars, all that, you know, the stuff you normally would save, but then trees too. 
Um, we had someone from the Santa, uh, Santa Cruz Bonsai Club come out and dig up most of the trees. We kept some of them um, that Lauren's mom and Paul's mom have taken uh, to take care of. Um, but then um, Daniel too. Daniel too. Yeah, Daniel took up and Daniel dug up a lot of trees. Actually, he has a lot. Of he has like forty of them, maybe. <laughs> yeah, and he's planning on building his own railroad. And so this is kind of one of the things of of paying it forward. Of you know, I'd rather see them go to someone else's railroad and be used and, you know, be enjoyed than getting, you know, bulldozed when they decide to redevelop the front yard. Um, and um, to that point, then also uh, the ones that people didn't take uh, generously, Nancy Schram, who is the owner of Carmen's nursery that sold us a lot of the trees initially um, took them back and uh, agreed uh, to sell them on commission for me, which was a w overly generous offer on her part um, to do that. Um, she even stored a bunch of the rocks from the railroad on her property. So like we saved the rocks off the railroad too. We did not, we, we took every piece we possibly could for long story short. Um, so um, this is what the Fern Creek and Western looks like now. Um, it's in storage and undisclosed location, um, and, uh, everything's safe and boxed and properly packaged. And to answer Sparky's question now, um, there is no new home currently. The home is the storage location. Uh, eventually, you know, we're going to get older and hopefully buy a house or something like that and have a place to set back up again, or someone will come along and generously offer their property again. But, um, you know, it, it's, um, it doesn't, other than storage, it does not have a home right now, but where it is, it's very safe and uh, well taken care of. So we're happy that, uh, um, that we're able to have it somewhere where we don't have to worry about it. Um, so to close out, I just want to talk a little bit about, about Eric's legacy um, and the legacy of Fern Creek and what it meant to us. Um, it was a huge playground for us, uh, essentially. Um, you know, the left-hand side there, you see me firing a live steam locomotive up. Um, you know, that was one of the great highlights after, you know, building the railroad was firing a live steam engine, running it around. And, uh, the baggers used this photo for our barrier garden railway society, used this photo to promote our railroad. And I always laughed at it because there's a beer in the shot at the very <laughs> bottom. Um, so, uh, you know, scale trains and beer do mix real ones and, and beer do not mix, but, um, uh, I always found this photo really funny. It was, it was from one of the many barbecues we would have after open houses where everyone would come over from Roaring Camp and, and you know, John and Sydney and all of our friends would come over and we'd have a grand old time eating barbecue and running trains. And the top right is Paul uh, after we dragged a piano from across the street into the yard um, that Charlie ended up taking. Daniel's down there, but that's my dog Duke actually, who's since passed in that photo too. And uh, Daniel's there after running his Shea off the end of the track. We, I mean, there, there's just so many wonderful stories that would take far too long to cover uh, of all the fun events we had there, all the laughs we had. It was, it was really a special place and really a special community that gathered at Fern Creek uh, for the events and also to work on the railroad. Eric, really was the integral part of making this happen. Um, Eric's generosity, like I've talked about in the layout tour, expanded into so many different areas from opening his house up to people uh, to allowing us to destroy his yard. Uh, but I think Eric's big mission, like I mentioned in the beginning, was to pass model railroading and, and the interest in real railroading on to the next generation. Um, and there's Eric letting kids run trains on the Fern Creek and Western, which was the happiest I saw him is when he was letting kids run trains uh, because he would always talk about seeing the light in their eyes um, when they would blow the whistle and get the engine to move. And that was the most special thing to him. And uh, I thought that, you know, I think that's kind of where Eric's legacy lives is in passing it on to Paul and I and other younger kids. And then that carrying on from us to, them, you know, to, to younger generations beyond us too. Um, Eric was also someone that loved his dogs very much. Um, uh, you see bingo there pictured on the train at roaring camp with Eric. Uh, Eric had three, you know, four dogs in the time that we were at Fern Creek. Um, and 
Eric's dog was always by his side. That was a staple of Fern Creek and Western. And, um, you know, Eric was just one of these guys that, you know, adored animals, adored children. He was, uh, had a heart of gold really, you know, there's no other good way to describe it. Um, and so that's how Eric's legacy in my eyes, um, lives on. Um, Eric was a preservationist in great respect. Also, um, not only at Niles Canyon, like I showed earlier, he owned a speeder at one time with his friend Craig. They took it all over the place, traveling on railroads with Narcoa, the North American uh, Rail Car Owners Association, or Rail Car Operators Association, excuse me, um, on rail lines all over the country. He really believed in railroad preservation of historic equipment um, and, uh, again, believed in younger people getting involved in historic preservation as well. It was something that was very important to him. Um and Eric was, you know, someone whose legacy is now carrying on in a different way um, beyond just railroading. Um, and uh, basically what I mean by this is that, uh, you know, Eric, as I mentioned in the layout tour, didn't really have a whole lot of family. Um, and uh, so when it came time to uh, bequeath his trust um, uh, that was left over when he passed away, he decided to do something rather interesting with it. Um, there was, I went, so I, long story short, I went to a private high school, um, and, um, they had this event every year called grandparents and special friends day. Uh, and I always called it uh, donation day because of I, in my opinion, it was the way for the school to, you know, try to get the grandparents to donate to the nonprofit school. Uh, well, if that was the goal, then they sure did succeed with this one because, um, at the time, both my grandparent, my grandpa's had uh, passed by that point, and um, Eric was like a grandfather figure to me, and my grandmothers couldn't come. So I brought Eric. Um, and uh, growing up, Eric never stayed at the same school for more than a year until he was like in ninth or 10th grade or something like that, because he uh, was raised by a single mother who was constantly moving around. So he never felt like he had a school that was home. And when he saw uh, Georgiana Bruce Kirby School, which is where I was at high school, he um, saw the community there and really believed in the education that they were providing. Um, but not only that, um, Eric had a strong belief in helping kids who were economically disadvantaged being able to go there because it was a school that had still does have you know high tuition. Private school is a a luxury. Um, and Eric wanted to see education be his legacy, uh, helping young people be his legacy, and making sure that the young people he was helping were those that would not receive the help otherwise. So he bequeathed uh, once the, you know the assets, you know the railroad had been distributed out to me, and you know other bits and pieces went to other people. Um, he bequeathed the entirety of his trust to Kirby School um, specifically for the purpose of financial aid for uh, low-income students to attend the school. Um, so that is his legacy that lives on beyond him now um, in people that will probably never know who Eric was, um, but will forever you know, be benefited by um, Eric's generosity and kindness, uh, which is something I'm very proud of. So the future of Fern Creek and Western, you know, obviously not going to a new home, but I wanted to touch briefly before we left on what Eric's impact had on Paul and I uh, and other people that helped and how that's influenced where we're heading in life. So me, obviously, I, you know, now the operations manager of the Oregon Coast Scenic Railroad. Uh, if it hadn't been for people like Eric, um, you know, uh, influencing my love and trains and, um, and guiding me along through my teenage years and uh, making sure I felt welcomed. I would have never stuck with railroading. Um, and so I now at 24 years old, hold a managerial position at a very well-known and very well-respected tourist railroad. Uh, and I'm grateful to people who have been generous to me for that, because that would not have come if it weren't for generosity, you know, and um, below I just want to briefly touch on my where my modeling heads from here. I still will model in F scale, but not as frequently. I haven't really done anything since, you know, Eric passed, or really since the Fern Creek and Western uh, was dissolved. But 
I and Paul both have an interest in Southern Pacific Railroad, particularly in 1955 in my case. Um, and so I'm trying to get back into that and re-explore, reignite that, you know, that interest in doing HO scale because I live in an apartment now. And uh, that's where my modeling heads from here until Fern Creek can, you know, come back one day. And so, Paul, I'll let you talk about where you're heading at this point. Uh, sure. Yeah. I, um, like Trevor said, I have an interest in SP 1950s as well. And I do that. But uh, recently, I've kind of been uh, staying with the FN3 uh, scale because it's just really nice to work in a large scale. And uh, Daniel and I have, uh, taken up a lot of projects that we've wanted to work on. And uh, I think in this photo, um, yeah, I've, I 3D printed a uh, new cylinders, a new saddle and a new smoke box front for my uh, Bachman Porter. This is one of the original uh, early Bachman Porters and uh, it didn't really have any detail on the, on the saddle and the cylinders uh, didn't match any photos that I'd seen. So I, I spent some time in 3D and then printed it on my uh, resin 3D printer. Yeah, and I should I should mention here, Paul has become quite the 3D modeler. He printed a lot of stuff for Fern Creek over the years um, and has pretty much self-taught himself how to do it. Um, and it, the stuff he turns out is incredible. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm very kind that you say that. I would say, you know, I'm... I would say I'm a hobbyist 3D modeler. I, I definitely know people that do professionally and they can run circles around me and they'll be better than me forever. But I, I, I know enough to be dangerous. <laughs> yeah. I'm looking at that picture right there and that's, look at that. I mean, that's that's some pretty good modeling right there, Paul. I think you- Yeah, what I did was, uh, oh, thanks. I, I found the Porter catalog from the 1900s and there was a photo of a, Porter in there that looks similar to mine. So I, I laid it up against and actually built the uh, cylinders against the shape of that, that photo. Well, and good... something else that's kind of cool to mention about this particular engine, Paul's had this engine since we were. Oh uh, yeah. This is the first. And this engine ran on that mud pit Pacific. We were talking about at the very beginning of Paul and yes, I playing did. in the mud pit as toddlers running trains around this engine survived that abuse somehow and is now kicking around as Paul's latest project, which I think is kind of neat. Uh, well, another full circle sort of thing. Yep. And then uh, you were talking about Daniel too. Um, yeah. Uh, Daniel McConnell, uh, as Trevor mentioned earlier, he's a fantastic scratch builder and you can tell him you want something and he'll figure out a way to do it. Uh, and which in this case is what happened. Daniel and I, uh, you know, we're, as we're taking the Fern Creek and Western down had been talking about, well, you know, we, we have room at our houses that we could maybe build some track, nothing the size of the Fern Creek and Western, but maybe some small logging layouts. And we started talking, well, it's, you know, kind of expensive to buy switches and stuff. And that's really going to be the holdup. Uh, I think one time we calculated uh, on the Fern Creek and Western, how much it would cost if we bought all the switches new, which by the way, we didn't do, uh, but it would have been like $9,000 or something for, for all the switches on the railroad. And uh, that, that just wasn't going to happen for Daniel and I. So we said, well, I think the only way we can do this economically and to our satisfaction is if we build the switches ourselves, which uh, we knew was going to be a pretty difficult process. And uh, we started to research it and there really was no, plans online for F scale one to 20.3 switches that we could find. Uh, there was some commercially available and I encouraged people to, to look into buying those to support railroad companies and model companies. But um, in our case, we wanted to do it ourselves. And uh, Daniel uh, was uh, drew up an excellent plan by hand, by the way, uh, he's an excellent draftsman and um, drew up a switch plan. And uh, this, I think the switch on the left there is our prototype switch that we built. And we've since built six of them uh, to much higher quality standard. But this, this one, the first one is still usable, but uh, uh, they're, they're redwood ties and the rail we get is uh, AMS code 250 brass rail. And the frogs are uh, Sunset Valley number six Durlin frogs. And uh, if, I think we're gonna go on to uh, design two eventually too, where we uh, do completely uh, 
brass frogs and uh it's an evolution but we're uh, really happy with the switches so far and uh, they're very robust so you still love brass drag yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah we, the ties are just cut down from redwood fence board and we just uh, nail the we we drill we take the dremel and drill the spike holes first and then nail the spikes and we found that works a lot better than just uh nailing it straight into the ties do you, do you find that it splits if you nail it straight in no the ties are big enough that it doesn't really split we haven't had that problem but uh it just take it's a lot quicker <laughs> yeah it's easier to put them in right much easier much easier yeah especially with two people so with that um we want to thank everyone who uh <laughs> you like that yeah we want to thank everyone who helped make this railroad so special and uh you know everyone that came and supported us at events supported us in the building of the railroad supported the people building the railroad by bringing food and uh, taking care of issues with the house and you know the list just goes on and on and on and on and on and we have a whole list of people that we are thank we thank at the end of the layout tour but here's some pictures of just some of them i just wanted to show some of the people that made this community of model railroaders and Fern Creek and Western folks so special. Um, and ultimately the biggest thank you goes to Eric because without him, none of this would have been possible. And I hope that this live show and the layout tour and all of the Fern Creek and Western videos over the years will carry out his legacy and um, show people just what a exceptional human being he was. Yeah. What there, it's also going to happen, Trevor, is those videos have enough content in them that someone somewhere is going to also be inspired. And none of it would have happened without Eric. Um, something that I found interesting and I didn't realize until more recently, like within the past year or so, was just how much work Eric did just of regular maintenance on the yard and the railroad in the yard because once you went away to Oregon uh, it was still working until he wasn't really able to do it anymore and then it was like oh now we really realize how much of that he was doing right right I, I you know I kind of like to think of it as me being the visionary if you will for a lot of the stuff I mean we definitely you know um, a it lot, wasn't most just of the bad ideas for your ideas. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 and we never, we never would like, it was never a dictatorship of like, you know, this is the idea and this is how we're going to do it. We always would talk about it, figure out the best solution. Cause quite frankly, when I mean that, I mean the ones that actually happened. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, we, they, you know, we'd beat down the ideas and figure out what we could actually pull off. But you know, the, and, and Paul and I would do a lot of the new construction, right. Buildings and, and, and bridges and, and, and more track and that sort of thing. But when it came down to it, um, you know, even when I lived in Santa Cruz, I could really only go over there two days a week cause I had a full-time job. Um, it, you know, other than the first two years or so of the railroad and Paul, uh, had jobs too throughout and would only be able to go there you know, once or twice a week too. Um, so, you know, other than big pushes, you know, we were trying to get something done. Um, we weren't there that often. Eric was the one that was there every day and was taking care of everything from watering the plants to, you know, uh, keeping the track basically maintained, pulling weeds, you know. And when that went away, it was very clear that it was um, too big of a railroad for us to maintain at the end. Towards right. the end there, uh, Daniel and I and uh uh, Justin and his uh, his grandmother were uh, taking care of the railroad because Eric, uh, you know, couldn't do it. Even though he he wanted to, yeah. he tried. He came out there with his cane and he he he, want, he tried as hard as he could to work on the railroad, but it, it got yeah. to the point where he just couldn't. So uh, and it was yeah. And by that point, I was I would come down about once a month. I would I was making a point to come down once a month to you know do things, but generally that time would get taken up with putting in a new structure or a bridge or, you know, whatever, or, or doing a big capital improvement project, if you will, um, to utilize the time the best that we could while I was there. Um, so the maintenance really fell on Eric. Uh, mm -hmm. 
that was one of the things that really was a revelation to me. I mean, you guys probably knew it all along, but I had we knew one. it, but we knew it, but it wasn't um, at the forefront of our minds until his passing. Yeah. Well, that was interesting. I just saw the comment from Dave from Sparky. <laughs> oh, wow. So now that I've thoroughly made everyone depressed, um, no, I, I, I'm not no. depressed. I'm just, it's just surreal to me. You know, this is the final send off. There won't be any more unless I dig back through the archives and find something like, Oh, I forgot. I took that. You know, I'm not sure there's going to be any more Fern Creek and Western videos until the new Fern Creek and Western someday pops up somewhere. So I would say that's true. Yeah. It's, it's a lot of fun, though, and it, it was a lot of fun over the years. And, um, you know, one of the interesting things is the social aspect of it. You know, because I always talk about trains and model railroads being ex an excuse to hang out, <laughs> which it really is. You know, I mean, trains are cool. Let's not kid anybody there. But at the end of the day, we're really just hanging out together. And it became, the Fern Creek and Western became like, a hangout for a lot of different people from a lot of different places and all, you know, all over the yeah. place. On, on yeah, the and Kevin was the, Kevin was the one that famously said it probably will never happen again. Not the same way, not the same way, but you said something Trevor in the layout to our video that came out this morning that kind of hit me hard, which was, and it's really the truth of it is I don't think the Fern Creek and Western chapter one is what I'm going to call it had to come to an end because of the circumstances, but I don't think one, it would be the same without Eric, but number two, I don't think we'd, we would want to continue it without Eric. No, you know, chapter one. So it was kind of, I, a I, and I'll, I'll say comment. with certainty, you know, um, there were many nights toward the end of that railroad's existence where, you know, we were putting the railroad away and everyone would have gone home, you know, at the end of the day. And I'd be there kind of doing some work at the end of the day, sitting in Eric's house that was empty by myself. And I was just like, I don't know how much longer I can do this. You know, I, I just wanted it to be over because it wasn't, it wasn't the same. Yeah. That just kind of struck me though the way you said that, the way you put it. So, wow. Anyway, um, I mean, we've been having questions come in this whole time. Uh, I mean, I do, I do think that, I mean, I have time if anybody has. Yeah. You know, I, I, I have time. If anyone wants to ask some questions, I'd be happy yeah. to answer them. I'll um, last, last fire question. away. <laughs> yeah. But in the meantime, um, I thought about, and I don't know if you remember this, but I kind of was like, hey, you know, you guys could build it at my house. But, and this part, I think, was part of the revelation of realizing how much work Eric did maintaining stuff. The stipulation when I made that, that offer, if you will, was I can't maintain it. So it would have to be, you know, people yeah. would have to come over and just do that as often because I don't know. I don't know what it takes. I mean, I would assume it's almost like an everyday thing going out there and puttering around the yard. It's certainly, I've, unless you have like a, you know, drip irrigation system or something like that, you have to at least water it every day. Yeah. And that's not um, something that I was able to do. So I was kind of like, yeah, you guys can build it at my house if you want, but I can't take care of it. And it's it, just like, no, <laughs> it's not happening. It, it took um, a special set of circumstances to make that railroad happen the way it did. Yeah. Uh, and that, that's it, way not easily it, yeah. repeatable. Yeah. You know. I, I no, learned I'm, a lot because I don't think I knew all that stuff from the beginning. So it looks like we're getting some questions here. So I'm going to shut up. What 3D software do you use? Oh, it's probably a question for me. Um, I use Fusion 360, which is actually a, a you can get it as a free uh, program for personal use. So I definitely recommend that. And uh, it took me a while to figure out how to use it. And I'm, I'm still learning every time I start a new project, but uh, you know, do it for, for a couple of months or just start, start with one really simple thing and, uh, and um, you'll get the hang of it. Um, 
Yeah, I was going to say, I, I definitely am going to miss the uh, hangout spot that the Fern Creek and Western became. It was, uh, yeah. uh, I, I don't think it'll, it, it probably won't be repeated in that fashion. I mean, it, I, I just can't see that happening, unfortunately. We'll still, yeah, we'll still find excuses to hang out. Like, I yeah, think yeah. next weekend we're going to go to Readley together. That'll be bring right. about, you know, eight or ten of us <laughs> that have been mm-hmm. just, to, but uh, a local, you know, thing where we can hang out and run trains and just, you know, not yeah. worry about, you know, anything too seriously. I, that's going to be pretty hard to to replicate. Maybe yeah, someday, I but I don't think he's watching. But I nominate Kevin because he has a place now, and you know, he's, <laughs> he's getting to be. Kevin old. also has a really large time suck now in the form of a kid. So I don't. I think know, that's but he's going to want to expose the kid to all this wonderful train stuff. Put him to work so, on the railroad. Yeah, have work. Plus, the kid's going to be small and close to the ground, so the kid. Well, this is this is why he said he wanted to make a trench railroad. There's no way the kid could destroy it. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, there you go. So Dave Dave does have the uh, notoriety of being the only person that ever crashed a train into a water tower, and I still don't understand how that happened. Yeah, (laughs) that was definitely a uh, uh, one of those ones that's totally unexplainable. (laughs) <laughs> like probably magnetic oh. or something, you know, pull it right off. I don't oh, know. Oh, what happened? Paul froze. Is he frozen on your end too, Trevor? No, he's he's good on my end. Oh. I'm okay. Okay. Something weird just happened with my computer then. Sorry, Paul, I didn't hear what you said. I probably stepped on you, didn't mean to. Oh no, I was just making a joke. Oh. Joke time. <laughs> well, I'm not see oh here we go. Hang out at my place. Who who's DCM pictures? Is that Daniel? That's Daniel. Oh, it is. Okay. Yeah. Well, you can come over anytime, Daniel. I don't know if Paul knows how to find me. Tre- Trevor knows how to find me, though. <laughs> I've been to the intergalactic headquarters many a times. I yep. think I'll be in San Jose tomorrow. So <laughs> maybe. Oh. Are you coming over? Uh, pretend- uh maybe, maybe. Are you gonna be over here with Daniel or what? No, on, on a on a trip to maybe pick up some model trains. We'll see. Oh, pick up model trains. Where do you mm-hmm. pick up model trains? I saw, I saw something on Facebook Marketplace that I might want. So we'll, we'll see Uh-oh. see what happens. Oh boy. Well, you know, <laughs> it's an addiction. Let's let yep. let's not yep. kid anybody. Never stop. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Well, I, I'm not seeing a lot of questions come in, so I think everyone's won't. either totally depressed or uh, they heard me talking for too long. One of the, well, two. I'm sure they found it interesting. <laughs> yeah, ask some questions for yeah. Paul or for me. We've been listening to Trevor too long today, right? Yeah, I've been talking too much today. <laughs> yeah, well, well I, I just want to say that was a great presentation, Trevor. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, Thank you. it really was. So thanks for putting that all together, Trevor. Um, I find that the story really inspirational more than depressing because it really knowing more about Eric really brings a lot more stuff into focus. Like for example, one of the tagline or the tagline for this YouTube channel and what I do on YouTube is three things, model railroading, preserve historic preservation and prototype railroading. And those are like the three main things and of course, you know, I'm also pretty passionate about advocating and helping kids get into it as well. And that's all the same stuff that Eric was really an advocate for and showed in his in the way he lived his life. And it makes more sense to me that, you know, why he was one of the original train crew members, too, because it's, he see, you know, he could see what I was doing. And, you know, we're speaking the same language here and he got it which I think is what happens with train crew members. They, they get it. You know, they understand what that mission is about. And it's kind of cool really to hear all of these things and, and really learn more and understand more about Eric because we didn't get, I mean, we talked plenty like over the years that I was over there, but it was never really about, you know, more in-depth stuff. Like I didn't know until more recently that he was so involved at Niles Canyon doing all those restoration and preservation projects. I didn't know that, you know, that was something I learned only within the past, 
I don't know, three or four years because he never talked about it. He never right. talked about a lot of stuff that he Eric, did. Eric was very, you know, close to the vest with a lot of personal stuff, even to us. Yeah. Like there's, you know, after his death, there was a lot of things like we found out he had a sister, which I never knew about, oh, you know. Really? Hmm. Yeah. So, you know, there's a lot, lots of things that we, you know, found out later on down the line. It was a mystery. He, <laughs> he has a history and, and, you know, and that was, we, you know, it was, it was two different Eric's. We, we knew Eric as railroad, Eric, you know, mm -hmm. grandfather figure mentor, Eric. And that was fine. You know, there, there was parts of his life that maybe weren't so glamorous um, or caused the trauma or whatever you want to call it. And, and, um, and that was fine that he didn't want to share that, you know, he wanted to live yeah. what he was, the life he was living now to the fullest and, yep. and, you know, mentor young people. That was what he wanted. And, um, you know, quickly on the passenger car restoration stuff, John, um, another thing that's kind of a, yeah, Paul knows where I'm going with this. Um, another little Eric secret that it was something he never really told people was he actually owned his own, uh, passenger car. Um, I am not a hundred percent sure where it is. I know he, uh, basically left it, you know, he was starting to restore it and I think realized how much it was going to take to get it going again. And, uh, he tried to petition the city to put it in the front yard where the Fern Creek and Western ended up being put. Uh, I don't know how he was planning on getting that in there. Um, but in any case, um, he did own a car, um, and never really know, knew what happened to it. Um, I don't even know what car it is. Um, but he did own a private rail car and I've seen pictures of the inside of him working on it. So that he, he did, he did in fact own his own passenger car. I remember someone mentioned that it might've been you Trevor. And they said, don't ever ask him about his private rail car. Cause it would instantly cause like a reaction that wasn't something you wanted to know. About. Yeah. It was a subject you didn't bring up. <laughs> right. <laughs> How, there were uh, some hard feelings on that one. Yeah. Someone was asking how old he was. How old? He how was old 79 was he? when he passed away. That's what I thought. Yeah. So his 80th birthday would be in uh, weeks about two weeks from now. Yeah. Well, I'm glad that I knew Eric. Um, he was one of those people that, you know, well, you go through life and I'm sure you guys have already encountered this because you knew Eric, but there are people as you go through your life that, make an impact on you. And he's definitely one of those characters in, in my life. Probably not as much of an impact as he has had in both of your lives, but you could tell he's one of those guys. <laughs> so. Absolutely. Anyway, yeah. And I see a lot of Eric in the way that, you know, I now interact with people that I see at my place of employment. You know, we get, young people coming in trying to learn about railroading young kids who are seeing their first steam locomotive ever, you know, and I see a lot of myself, a lot of Eric in my desire to make sure that those people have a good time, come back, want to get involved uh, and, yeah. and have a passion for it. Everyone I've knows always... the, oh. I was just going to say, everyone knows the stigma of, you know, going to a model railroad club or a, a museum and, and being turned down because, you know, you're made to feel insignificant by members that, you know, are there to, you know, play with trains, but they don't really care about anyone else. But uh, I feel when you do it publicly like that, you have the responsibility to invite people and uh, be generous about it if they show interest, which is exactly what Eric did and what John does. So, you know, in any case, when someone's showing interest, uh, you, you should definitely, you know, even if it's inconvenient for you, you should still help them out. And uh, I'm, I'm sure it'll, it'll work out great. So yeah, more people in the two, hobby. Two things that I would say about that. Uh, one is I found, found myself really copying Eric at the open houses. Cause you know, I came down and helped out at every open house probably for the past seven years or six I think it, all but uh, the number. first one, you were at every single one, but that very first one. Okay. And then I started operating the train to help. And I would find myself bending 
over to let a kid put you know push this button and you'll listen you know you'll hear the whistle and they get so excited you know and i saw eric do that out front like that picture you showed all the time like oh that is a great idea let's get them you know pushing the buttons and getting excited about what they're doing here and i do the same thing although i i haven't been there as much more in the past year or two but over at the sbhrs where i volunteer uh, the South Bay Historical Railroad Society, they have the Santa Clara Depot that you see me on the podcast quite often, you know, going down there to do something. And I would do the same thing there where I would, you know, find some kid would be watching the trains, you know, with the parents there. And I'd be there with my phone because I used the Y throttle and would show them the button to push. And then they could listen to the, the horn blow and get all excited about it. And yeah, that was a, a really... I don't know, kind of a great example that was set, I think, by mm -hmm. Eric. I don't know that I saw a lot of people do that before that. But the yeah, one well, think the about it, he was a, a pioneer in that because that's what sure. the point of Ma was when it started when Paul and I were really young. Right. And, and I was uh, gonna that mention was, that, yeah. I was gonna mention the Museum of Art and History because what struck me there, and I mentioned this on the podcast when I went there in I think 2018 or 2019, that there are these little pedestals that are at kid height and they're the, the big Lionel, you know, controllers and they have them there specifically for little kids. And that is just huge because, you know, there's nothing like the thrill of pushing the lever or turning the knob and watching that train that you're controlling move, right? That's one of the fascinations I think that gets kids interested in, model trains in the first place because you're absolutely you know, control the thing so that was a big deal to me because it, it really made the intention very obvious and very clear what they were trying to do there which was to make it a place good safe place for little kids to be able to run the trains that you know normally they would be chased out of the the building by the old guy don't touch my damn train you know yeah exactly yeah well and 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 you know and you know i think eric one time said and i think it was actually on that live show that if i don't have kids run the trains he jokingly said oh then no one will maintain my railroad for me and <laughs> you know it, yeah it's a joke but 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 to to his point we had a lot of people that came in to fern creek and western over the years who were young kids that eric let run the trains and eric if they saw they were responsible would invite them back to for a separate day to come run trains and that's mm -hmm. how we ended up getting like Justin, for instance. Right. Um, and there was another kid, Jordan, who would come over somewhat regularly. Um, and he also would come to Roaring Camp and see me on the steam engine and all that. So, you know, um, that was, uh, I think Eric had a point there in terms of not only passing it on, but having, you know, the team, building the team, building the community so mm -hmm. that you could work on something together. The Fur Creek and Western was a team for sure. It was... Uh... Yeah, it, it, a railroad that size, you, outside, you need a team like that. And uh, thanks to all those those people and uh, and the new people that came in, especially near the end, uh, it was all possible, which wouldn't have happened if, you know, we, we turned people away and we said, no, we're just a private railroad club. You know, we're, we were pretty open to people, you know, helping out if they wanted to. We oh, look, it's Nick. Hey, Nick. <laughs> Nick okay. was a regular operator at uh, open houses and uh, had uh, some really neat live steam engines, including a model of the West Side Lumber Company number no. three, which is now the Roaring Camp number no. two. And your favorite engine of all your time. Your favorite engine. My yep. favorite engine of all time. <laughs> a lot of great yeah. stories on the prototype of that one. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. There was also a comment up above that said, Are you still active in uh, G Gauge? Um, we kind of explained a little bit about that earlier, but yes, we are. And I actually have a car on my workbench right uh, now. That I'm been working on that one on. for a while. I've been working on this one for a while. This has always been a back burner project, but yes, very much still active in it. Well, actually, Trevor, since we're on topic there, because you said something on one of the recent videos, I don't not sure I remember which one it was, or maybe you just told me privately. I don't remember, but you said maybe it was on the layout tour. I don't remember now. I have such a terrible memory, but you said that 
between now and Fern Creek and Western, the next generation or chapter two or what, you know, whatever it's going to be someday that you were going to focus on working on weathering, super detailing all of that rolling stock so that it will be like a real showpiece of a layout eventually when it gets rebuilt somewhere. And I thought that was a really cool idea because you can still model without a layout. And there's a cat behind me biting a box. That's what that noise was. Yeah. We have very I'm surprised our new cat hasn't tried to scratch on the door. We have very interesting cats here. This oh, one yeah, Lark the cat. Yeah, this Lark one the cat. has adopted us. Uh, it, he, I think, belongs to somebody else, but he eats and sleeps yeah, here. I like every, that cat. Yeah, every single night. Here he is. He's in for the night, I think. And he likes to bite boxes. Hmm. I I don't understand, but maybe it's a, just a but cat. Anyway, yeah, to answer your question, John, that was something I said on the layout tour. Okay. Um, and, uh, you know, right now, I'm definitely a little bit on a break just because the teardown of Fern Creek was exhausting. And um, there's also just a lot going on at work right now. Right now I'm working six days a week most of the time. Um, uh, so, you know, it, 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 I'm taking a little bit of a break. And I also want to diversify my interests a little bit and get back to my SP models a bit more in HO scale. But I'll still be definitely working on Fern Creek and Western models. And yeah. uh, and then that question there about running real steam engines. Yes, that is my job. Um, it has been. My, what? It has been for quite some time. It has been for some time. Um, but my main job is actually operations manager for Oregon Coast Scenic. But I'm also a certified locomotive engineer there too. Right on. Well, guys, I think it's time for dinner. <laughs> I think you're right. Um, I, d again, want to thank you for taking the time to do this. Um, I think that uh, Eric would have been proud to, you know, realize the impact that he made. He would have been humble about it and talked it down, but the impact to oh, me yeah. is very <laughs> obvious. Uh, you guys, to me, are very solid people, good friends, and I appreciate the uh, sharing of the, the railroad over the years. It's meant a lot to us here and just you know thank you yeah there it is yeah. and thank it's you good. for all the documentation because like nick yeah. said if it hadn't been for that he probably would have never found out about it. think of the amount of people that found out about us from your videos and all the the publicity that got us and all the fun times we had filming them so that, thank that is you. one thing is you know though the railroad is gone it's heav heavily videoed and documented which is yeah is very really well great. documented well it has yep. its own playlist here so <laughs> yeah <laughs> anyway. all yeah, right it was then. very nice of, of you to do all that yep all right so thanks again i uh, want to thank everybody for watching uh, if you missed the layout tour video came out this morning it is the most comprehensive and complex video, I think, of any layout that I've done. And uh, boy, it sure represents a lot of work and effort and planning and rearranging and, and re-editing and fixing. And, and uh, I know it was, uh, I probably was being a little cantankerous toward the end there, but I'm really glad that we did what we did because it turned out great. And uh, that's a thanks to you guys too, so. Anyway, Thank you. if yep, if if there's nothing else, we'll go and thanks everybody, and we'll see you all sometime soon. And thanks.